welcome to the official Lakes International Comic Art Festival podcast. My name's Ian. And my name's Nikki, bringing you the best in comics and graphic novels and updates from the festival. Hello and welcome to the Lakes International Comic Art Festival podcast episode 75. My name is Ian. And I'm Nikki. And I can't speak again. I'm struggling today What's to get the, 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 the launch and the, the, launch. the whole title and everything. I need to be able to talk. I used to be able to when I was young. <laughs> but now I'm old. Old. Do you and need your new teeth in, love? Can you buy We can't even get any new you teeth. Can't what have are you on teeth. about? You can't have teeth. You can't, can't have, have anything. Don't break your glasses. Can't have anything. Yeah. So lockdown continues in the good old UK. Yes. Um, slowly, slowly edging towards lifting, if you listen to this in the future. I w- We're getting there-ish. Well, no, we've ish. peaked. We've peaked, so we now have to keep this up to stop it, mm-hmm. peak, you know, going up again. Uh, we're going down the other side of the horrible, horrible slope. So as long as we are sensible, stay in and listen to the podcast. Uh <laughs> Did you well, see if, that? Did you see that? Yeah, it's good, wasn't it? We well, can't really you advertise a podcast a for people who are listening to the podcast. <laughs> you do that on a loop, don't you? Who okay. would want to go out when they can listen to us? Yes, and continue. No, I was trying to sell it there, wasn't oh, I? Right. And you just you just messed it up for me. Anyway. Just typical. Where do you think the comic industry is going to go from here? Because obviously, In what way? Um, Diamond isn't sending out comics at the minute. Mm-hmm. I think they're starting to re- Look at the, getting them out there. But there's going to be lots where we get open up again. Isn't there? <laughs> well, no, they stopped down, stopped production in many t- areas. Oh, okay. D- do we think it's going to recover? Yeah. Do we think the digital is going to slowly but surely take over a bit? Well, I think with the whole of this lockdown thing, digital in every way has has stepped mm-hmm. up to fill in the breach. Um, but I don't think. I think it will have increased readership digitally, but if they're like me, then you do like to hold the comic or book or whatever in your hand mm-hmm. so i expect it will recover but it'll be a slow process it will so, i think i do think weeklies are going to go down the line i could see it going to weekly digital digitally yeah just just because and then you're collected in your graphic novels yeah yeah are if a you different want... form that you, it's nice to have a big bound book yeah but i do find little comics annoying yeah <laughs> i really do i can understand that it's same with magazines as well yeah so the ones you want to space keep. to keep them nice in boxes and stuff. It's not so bad that like, your, your women's magazines and stuff because you don't. Women's well, magazines, no. wow. Well, it's the gossip ones, isn't wow. it? Stuff like that. Men well, they don't go straight them. in the bin. Well, that's it. You don't keep them. <laughs> that's They're the not a type of thing well, you keep. Recycling nature. But I don't know. I'm talking Games Workshop, White Dwarf, gardening that's stuff. That's just hanging around in the bathroom. Um, that is. Stuff with recipes in. You want to keep that, and that's perfect for digital yeah. form. And comics also fits on that. Yeah. If you can have your full collection, episode one to. 200 mm. of spider-man all on your ipad yeah yeah it, yeah see i can see it because i still buy physical books even though i've got a kindle because i still like to hold a book and i find it yes but personable. that's that's com- a book is comparing to a graphic novel or a, a collected edition of a yeah not a magazine but then magazine. I'd, I'd rather go out and buy a magazine than because it's really hard to navigate it on a on an ipad it's not really. No, it is because it's not designed for an iPad. So therefore, you're moving it around, and, and mm-hmm. yeah, you see. So maybe it's got some way to go in other ways as well. I just think we're just seeing that the whole move. You know, video games obviously it's a little bit surely going over oh, there. See, I think that's a good idea. Media, video, that's gone. Yeah, basically, yeah. there's very few. You don't you don't tend to buy your I do. DVD. Some people buy DVDs, but generally not. I'm only collecting up the Studio Ghibli ones on. Yeah, but are you DVD. really doing that now? They're on currently on Netflix. Would you? Well, they're not all on Netflix, are they? We've had About this discussion. One. Yeah. One. <laughs> so that, that's not really an argument there, dear. Yeah, but with that one, it's not necessarily going to be forever on Netflix, is it? So I'd quite like to have the physical copy no, so I can watch there it is whenever. That. There is that. So that's that's my argument there. Okay. So carry on buying them. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see, obviously, the, the biggest hit, and this isn't just in comics and everything is retail, mm. um, your shops, your comic shops are going to struggle. The little ones, yeah. Your little um, independence is going to be really hard for them. And that's the same for every, everything everything retail-wise. Yeah, well, we're seeing even the big retailers, we're losing some of them now, aren't we? So there's going to be things that aren't going to recover from this. There is, definitely, because you, you've pushed people, I keep saying it, 10 years forward. Mm. You've, you've sped up the, the use of the internet to yeah, for online the, shopping for people who wouldn't do it before. Street, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it's just sped it up, and unfortunately, unless a comic shop's got something really special mm. to offer, um, they're going to struggle. Yeah. And they've got to be that type of shop. 
and this is the same for video games it's the same for tabletop games it's the same for all that sort of niche hobby aspects yeah and, and fanboyism you've got to be able to offer that customer service mm. where you can talk to customers about the comics page 45 is a, mm. a good example because mm. Stephen there just he, he rambles and knows everything yeah about but comics. it's creating a shopping experience yes. more than just going into a shop and getting one. And that's what they've got to be doing. Yeah. So those, we have been in a couple of comic shops where they almost ugh as you walk in. Yeah, like they don't want you to be there. They're yeah, going to struggle gonna down the line. Yeah. You've got to have something interesting mm. in all aspects of shopping, bar supermarkets. Yeah. And your cheap, you know, cheap stack up high selling power cheap. shops type Yeah, thing. they don't matter. But yeah, they've, they've got to be, which could be interesting. It could create Shops have, have got a real personality. Yeah, so when, it might actually encourage... Because, I mean, the high street is going to have to encourage small independents in mm-hmm. as yes, well to fill, to fill these spaces. Shops. So it could be a little renaissance we'll of see. things we'll as see. well. It's, it's, it's an unknown, isn't it? This mm-hmm. whole thing's a big unknown quantity. It is, it is. Um, anyway, what's on this episode, Nicole? I have no idea. Exactly, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Me and the cat? Yes, we know. Um, <laughs> so Pete's taken over this episode. He, we're going to have is. to have words with him. We, we really are. Because he ain't getting a pay rise. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, he can. He can have a 100% pay rise. <laughs> uh, Pete has uh, spoken to one of his heroes this week, mm-hmm. BPRD creator, artist, Lawrence Campbell, mm-hmm. um, which has been creating a comic called Old Haunts with Ollie Masters and Rob Williams, who's having yeah. the show. Yeah. Rob. Um, so he talks to him about his work and processes in the comic itself, mm-hmm. uh, which is superb. Yep. You know, it's brilliant that Pete gets a chat to essentially his hero. Yeah. She's super it's rare. nice, isn't it? We, uh, we, I was going to say something then, but it wouldn't have been appropriate. Okay. Yeah. I'm intrigued now. You'll have to tell me after. I will tell you after. Okay. <laughs> uh, Tom reviews all the sad songs by Summer Pierre, which Aww. is published by Retrofit Comics. Mm-hmm. You say that like you don't even know what the comic's about. You've not read it. sad. We need to read it because yeah. I've looked at the cover. It looks really good. Mm-hmm. So we'll go have a look at that ourselves. Um, we chat to Jordan Thomas yes. about his new comic, Quarantine, uh, currently funded on Kickstarter. He's a lovely man. With absolutely shed loads of artists. Yes. 28 to be All exact. All of the artists. I've just looked on the cover. 28. <laughs> uh, so that is currently on Kickstarter. So have a I'll look at the link. I'll definitely check that out. Yeah. yeah. It's a link at the bottom of this uh, episode. And then Mike and Pete continue their uh, lockdown, mutter downs, world Again, cup of genres. We really have to stop them. Uh, this time it's Group C, which is covering fantasy, war, sci fi, and adult comics. Um, Are they allowed to read adult comics? <laughs> they're, they're, yes. Are they? Yeah, oh, we'll, we'll allow them. They're old enough. They're old enough. Mentally? Um, and also, please feel free to, to send a letter to their letters segment about <laughs> their got- segment. <laughs> um. <laughs> Message them or email us via the website. Uh, keep them going because it's keeping them busy. They've not got anything to do. No, bless They're them. They're both working still, but they've got nothing to do. <laughs> so enjoy that. That's a, a fair few hours worth of content there with them muttering on. But it's absolutely brilliant. So thank you again to yes, Mike, you. Pete and obviously Tom yeah. uh, for the work they're doing for the podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're not going to talk about much this episode. We're going to do next episode a big old review. Yes segment but i think there's enough content in this episode for us not to <laughs> mutter on too much uh, i do want to mention if you've got some kids lying around or maybe yourselves lying around lying around <laughs> doing nothing kids lying around. i just imagine like just a load of lazy lions just like Ugh. um the lakes have released some coloring in yes sheets hmm. which you can do online or print out Hello, and do as well, uh, which features imagery from Charlie Adlard, mm-hmm. Daryl Cunningham, Hunt Emerson, Sarah McIntyre, Junko Mizuno, Gilbert Shelton, Petteri Tikan, and Viz. Um, <laughs> I'm intrigued by the Viz ones now. <laughs> I like Junko's one. Um, print them out, colour them in, and then stick them up on Instagram with the hashtag like half colouring competition 2020. Mm-hmm. And if you've done it before the 14th of May, there's a chance to win some goodies. Ooh. Uh, which is always I good. I don't know where that route came from. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> it's because I've got hay fever. Again, we'll throw the link up yes. on the site to uh, have a nosy at that. And something I know Mike talks about a little bit later, but I'm going to mention it as well, the Walking Dead Humble Bundle deal. Oh, yes. Under 15 quid for every, every single, single Walking one, yeah. Dead comic. Absolutely ridiculous price. Yeah, do it. So, yeah, it's, it's all digitally. So as I was talking, mm. you know, yeah, it'd be nice to have those collected, but it would destroy your bookshelves. Yes. 
um go and check that out and it's for a good cause as well um mm-hmm. so yeah I may have already purchased that. I was waiting for you to tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, it's been a day <laughs> and he hasn't said he's bought it, but I bet he has. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of stuff, uh-huh. a lot of content mm-hmm. to read over many years. Mm-hmm. But yeah, now it's finished. Yeah. There's no more. Okay. It's done. Yeah. It's on. Yeah. Anyway. What have you bought today, makeup? There we go. Um, <laughs> and last thing I just want to mention what we've been playing, the amazing Streets of Rage 4. Oh, we have. Is out, um, I'm which, better than you. Well, it's better no. on you for a few of the stages. No. Yeah, it was. It was. Which, if, you, if you're on Twitter, you'll have seen loads of creators jumping on. Uh, Dave Cook is producing a book mm. about side-scrolling beat-em-ups. Yes. Um, which looks really interesting, which will be out early next year, I believe. Mm-hmm. So, well worth checking that out if you're a fan of this type of game. You'll get an IOU for Christmas for that book. All right, thanks. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, well worth um, checking that out come next year. But also, if you're a fan of those games, just this is a great incarnation of streets mm-hmm. of rage considering how rubbish updates have been yeah no it's it's great fun we've yeah, got to finish it fun. today we're on we will we're on stage six so we've got the other six to do now what what's that what well because my little tiny thumbs little tiny i've thumbs. got tiny little thumbs, tiny little thumbs. and it's, it's hard for me because you've got to use the cross paddy we don't have you. to well you do because you've got to press it twice isn't you am i supposed to do that with the twiddly bit so to get Push me forward, me anyway. thingy bit while I flick them with my feet. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> that's that's why you're not writing with a book. You. Yeah. <laughs> I flick them thingy with my feet. <laughs> so yeah, so I get a bit cramped up, but I was ready to carry on past the pain and the repetitive strain injury to to beat the system. But you you gave up and made a cup of tea. I do apologise. It's okay. Um, so next episode we'll we'll mention it now quickly. We'll have to say a big review episode we'll have mm-hmm. multiple comics to discuss yes. and also uh, we got julie tate to come on the show to talk about the festival of 2020 yeah tell us what's going on this year all the goodies mm-hmm. and the insights which we've not done since like day one so it was about time we <laughs> we gave her a chance what what number of episodes is this <laughs> 75 yep yeah. probably give them a chance to come and talk about their own festival <laughs> just occasionally just occasionally now and again um so yeah enjoy the rest of the content and that's how I'll leave it. Is that I? you leaving it? No, like that was awful. Even, yeah, that was terrible. Well, you do it. <laughs> and that's going to be all. No, I can't do it See? either. See? Oh, it's really hard when you put yourself under yeah. pressure like that. And don't look at me like it's that. It's hard being the, the, the main presenter. <gasps> the main presenter. I, I am the, the talent kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, you're <laughs> like the glue and I'm the sparkle. <laughs> <laughs> Let's leave it there. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Small Pressed, the review section of the Comic Art Festival podcast with Tom. Hope you are all safe and well and hope you are all managing to read loads of comics, make loads of comics. Now in keeping with the last review that I did, I'm actually working my way through books that I picked up at Thought Bubble. I'm taking this opportunity to crack on through my reading pile that's been building up and up for this whole entire time. So I'm doing something that's not so much a small press title, but something that comes from Retrofit Comics, which is sort of a a sister company of Avery Hill. It's uh, Retrofit is mainly based in the States, and I picked up All the Sad Songs by cartoonist and writer Summer Pierre. Which I thoroughly enjoyed this, I really did enjoy it. I think it's a... Beautifully drawn book, um, very strong illustration. There's a lot of good character pieces in this. There's very interesting uses of panels in the page and how they're broken up. There's amazing depictions of front covers of tapes and CDs and everything that are quite realistic. It's almost photo-like. But I'm getting my head to myself here. All the Sad Songs is the first full-length graphic memoir from Summer Pierre. It takes us on a journey through the soundtracks that shaped her, through mixtapes, boyfriends, late nights in Boston folk clubs and ill-fated cross-country road trips. Pierre weaves a moving meditation on music, memory and identity. That pretty much sums up the entire (laughs) comic, to be honest. Um, It's a nice lengthy piece. It's got a heck of a lot of writing in amongst it. It really does cover quite a large chunk, majority of her life, Summer's early days of making mixtapes and how she's identified with music and how it's really played in with a lot of relationships in her life, not just 
boyfriends and people that she's met whilst being a, a singer songwriter herself, but with like her family and her mum, and there's little glimpses of bits about her her dad and her stepdad and stuff in there as well. It really ties it all together. She does a, there's a lot of depictions of mixtapes and CDs and stuff that she's made, and she's actually made like track listings and stuff to go along with them as well, which is really good. But the only thing that I disconnected with it was that a lot of the music I really wasn't familiar with at all, and I. I'm very much a person that would say that I would have an eclectic taste in music. I don't know if it's maybe just it's a subgenre that I'm not really familiar with because I'm not entirely familiar with like say Lizzie Fair or Hole or or Tom Waits or anything like that. And it's it's very much of a of an American sort of Midwest soundtrack. I would say um, there is a couple of different artists and stuff that are on there as well but like I say she gives the entire track listings I think after reading this I would like to make up some of this tracks maybe source some of it on YouTube or Spotify or something and make up some of the CDs just to see if it would make a difference of listening to the tracks whilst reading along with the pieces I recently read Derf's uh, Punk Rock and Trailer Parks and he's got a track listing at the start to go along with the, the comic and it really made a difference, it made a really big difference, a, a big impact on the piece, so I'm wondering if it's maybe the same here with the different mixtapes, if you listen along with the different chapters, if it would make a difference. And that's another thing that's in it, is that she's got kind of different mixtapes for different chapters of the, the comic as well. And like I say, as it's going along, she's got very inventive ways of breaking up the page and playing with panels and structure on a page. There's a, there's a a page at one point that has just a lot of tapes and the titles of the artists on each of the tapes and it's just like these flowing banners that are going throughout the tapes and across the page that are continuing the narrative and, and is the writing for the next piece and telling you so like it starts off saying like there was no internet then so all of my discoveries happened through conversations at Scouring magazines and record stores, raiding my college radio stations, library and friends and acquaintances CDs, but that's all in like these banners that are swooping across it's, so it's not really what you would term in places traditional in, in comic making, it is very much almost like banging down her sort of dreams and thoughts and, and put transposing them onto the page which works really really well but there is certain points within it that it can become a little bit confusing as to where the words are going and what ones you're following it's fine when it's got speech bubbles or the little narratives at the top and the bottom in your big block black which may add is another thing that's very but that's a lot to do with art is very dark um in a lot of the boxes, a lot of the dialogue boxes that are in it aren't white with black text, they're actually black with white text. So it's fine when you're following along your, your sort of narrative pieces along there with your block text as it's going and, and telling you there, but as soon as it gets a wee bit inventive sometimes with lyrics or as bits flowing out of instruments or flowing across the page or stuff, it, it can get a little confusing to follow along. And even when it is block text, sometimes the page is set out in a way that it's hard to find where you're meant to be going with it but it is it keeps it interesting it keeps it playing with the form a wee bit like that it makes it a wee bit more interesting and you you can kind of push through that fact that it is a wee bit harder to follow along with it I mean there's there's really beautiful pages here of like outer body experiences and stuff that are just just like these massive art pieces that are kind of panels kind of play second fiddle to the actual whole display that is on the page it's really nice um i really like i really enjoyed the story i feel sometimes it can get a little lost and just ever so slightly pretentious in places but then when you're listen when you're reading along with somebody else's story, something that is so deeply personal. I mean there's there's a there's a large thing about sort of mental health and anxiety that plays throughout the the book from a sort of midpoint onwards that sort of 
guides the story from there on out. So she does explain certain moments, but there's always with that in the background. And I think when you're not really focusing on the actual event in hand, it can get a little lost, and it then just becomes moments of kind of self pondering and getting a bit sort of introspective and it can just kind of get a little lost in that respect but it is well worth pushing through and it is nice to see somebody playing with words and and not really point blank putting out there like this is what I did and this is what I did here and this is when I went here the, there is a, a little bit of word play and, and, and you know kind of trying to figure out at the same kind of extent as she's trying to figure everything out as well with her life and yeah, it really does play along nicely and like I say there is broken up bits in between with album covers and stuff that really give you a different sense of what Summer is capable of in her art there is beautiful illustrations of her as she's older and younger and like all the different people in her life are very identifiable and there's a difference in everybody's clothes or face or anything, which there's no one person the same at any point. There's good crowd scenes in that as well, and showing big packed houses by only really showing a couple of people. And like I say, by keeping it dark in clubs and stuff like that, you, you get away with only showing a couple of people, but still making it look like a packed house and stuff. It's it's a really fully accomplished piece, and... She's, she's an absolutely beautiful illustrator but some of the other stuff that's like realistic in between shows that she's a true artist in, in every respect it's, it's really nice and like I was saying it's quite a dark piece overall I would say that not many pages have got a lot of empty space there's not a lot of negative space and not a lot of white going on every sort of aspect of a page is really filled with black when it's when it's got an empty space or anything, it's usually when it's in a club, so it really packs out with the the blacks. I would like to see how she's done that, if it's been black paper and she's then went over it with white, or if it's been white and she's really packed it out with some, some heavy blacks. It would be really interesting to see. I'm interested to know if this was done traditionally or done digitally, the way it looks it looks very traditional, there's a lot of strokes and stuff in there that I don't think and sort of build up in ink that I don't think you'd be able to get in digital, well you probably could these days but it'd be you'd have to really intentionally put that focus into little bits but it's, it is really nice there's only a couple of times where the text is black with a white background it is mainly black with a black background with white text. But it's nice, it really plays with emotions, you get a feel of where she is uh, in her life at each aspect, and even with the change in music and the change in hairstyles along the way and stuff as well, and yeah, it's a, it's a great piece overall. I would definitely suggest that I just, you have to really be in the right mood to, to read this, and it is something that is extremely personal, rather heavy as well in tone. And like that, the art very much reflects that as well. But it's it's not all doom and gloom. It's very happy along the way. There is a nice sense of relationships between different people that really gives you that sort of breathing space in between the story as well. Yeah, overall, I really, really like this. And it's a really well put together book as well. It's an odd size. You can actually get all the sad songs through Avery Hill's website, um, if you go on to averyhillpublishing.bigcartel.com uh, and go under products, you'll be able to find it under the retro fix section. They've got a couple of things in there under the retro fix section. But yeah, all the sad songs is available there um, for £8. It's actually, it was the cover that actually attracted me to it in the first place. It's just her under a spotlight with a guitar, a load of music, and just a really nice orange and white all the sad songs with the tape behind it. It's a beautiful looking book. And of course you'll be able to get it from retrofit.storenv.com You can also get Summer Pierre on Twitter at Summer Pierre S-U-M-M-E-R-P-I-E-R-R-E And you get Retrofit Comics on Twitter at 
Retrofit Comics. R-E-T-R-O-F-I-T-C-O-M-I-C-S. Also the great Avery Hill Publishing at Avery Hill Publu. <laughs> it just stops at Pub L. So A-V-E-R Y-H-I-L-L-P-U-B-L Now just before I go I want to mention a couple of Kickstarters that are going at the minute Obviously there's Atomic Hercules issue 2 I think it's only up for 2 weeks total so I think it's a week into it or a couple of days into it so far so uh, time recording so it should have about a week a week and a half to go and that's by Tony Esmond and Adam Falp, I reviewed issue one previously. You can go back and have a look at that. Uh, Great series, absolutely great comic. So make sure and get on the Kickstarter for that. Don't miss out on that. There's also actually a a catch-up tier that you can get from there. So you can get issue one and two as well. And make sure to go across to Fair Spark Books and jump on the Hopper Detective of the Strange. There's a pre-order going out just now to get books one and two for a discounted price with with issue two coming out fairly soon. So make sure and go across to fairsparkbooks.co.uk and check that out today. Hopper Detective of the Strange issue one and two. And that is it from Small Press this time. If you have any new projects that are coming out, any new comics or anything that you would want to hear reviewed on the podcast or one mentioned at the end or anything then just give us a shout contact me on twitter at uramix u-r-a-m-y-x or you can get me across at that comics mel on twitter and instagram you can also email me if you like that comics mel at gmail.com and send us a link send us any little preview pictures or anything anything you want just suggestions lists give us a shout stay safe everyone Read loads of comics, and I will see you next time. Bye for now. How do welcome to Breakdowns, the comic art section of the podcast. I'm Pete Taylor. I'm a small press comics creator and illustrator. Online, I trade as this man, this Pete. And this episode, we have a special lockdown guest who has just found out he's been on the podcast before. It's Lawrence Campbell. Hey, Lawrence. Hello there, you all right? Yeah, good, thanks. Uh, so it was a bit of a surprise to find out that you were a returning guest to the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> when you first mentioned that, I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those sleep podcasting interviews you did. <laughs> yeah, uh, Lawrence was on previously on the um, Hell panel um, episode where I think you were talking with um, Sean Phillips and... It was a panel from uh, the festival last year. So, uh, how has lockdown been affecting you, Lawrence? Is it um, any? Is it much of a change for a freelance comic artist? To be honest, no, not really. Um, I've been kind of. It's, it's, it's not much of a change at all, other than having my family around. So, I'm, I'm just kind of still in the studio, still doing the same times. The only compromise we have is what we're going to watch at TV at lunchtime. So where before, I'd be able to just watch the politics show on my own. <laughs> compromise on bargain hunt. <laughs> okay, so what's what's the uh, the age range that you've got to satisfy with the, the TV? Oh, right, yes. Uh, well, he's, he's 13. So, oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, so so it's, not, it's not a bad that, age. That, that's, a, that's a good age. It's, have that's you done Umbrella good. Academy yet? You know what? I've done the... F- first episode um and i was kind of like, oh but then i'm, I'm finding it was just so much good tv as it were yeah. just, I, I, I do a few tasters and then the one that will grab me as a hook and then well i'm into it kind of thing so recently as a whole family i've been really enjoying the mandalorian I've, yes I've, it's kind of um same with ours I was, bit, I, I was a bit unsure about it but the more i watch it the more i'm falling in love with it totally it's, it feels like my Star Wars as well, if you see what I mean. It's like that and Rogue One are the ones that really, really appeal to me. And this feels that similar kind of feel. Very much so. And the music really gets under your skin, doesn't it? It does. I find myself whistling it as I'm going yeah. to drop it. <laughs> I just I love s- the idea that I'm a Mandalorian going <laughs> on doing my business. <laughs> I so want that soundtrack. It yeah. is. 
Good we're well. enjoying the Mandalorian as a family ourselves, and there's an yeah. extra bonus you can get as well. Once you've, we've watched the Mandalorian on YouTube, there's uh, uh, there's a kind of series called Screen Crush. Oh right. And it's one of those they do Easter eggs and references in each oh. of the episodes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy who does it as well, Ryan Airy. He's really funny. And uh, so it, the the whole family now look forward to watching it and then being able to watch the sort of screen crush episode afterwards. That sounds great. Yeah, he points out all the kind of aliens and all you know proper nerdy stuff, which which yeah. of the spaceships is based on another spaceship. Oh, wow. and okay. Apparently, the guy who's kind of done a lot of the the episode rights with um, John Favreau, he's one of the guys behind the Clone Wars TV right. show. So okay. I think they've weaved, which is, I've never watched the Clone Wars right. TV show. So they've weaved a little bit of the kind of back history of that show into this one as well. So he kind okay. of talks it through that. But yes, TV show, TV show compromises. I know that one a lot. <laughs> so you, uh, has lockdown affected your work? I mean, have you been uh, been told to put the pencil down? I have. It was a weird one. I, I finished um, Old Haunts, which I've been working on. Yeah, for about a year kind of thing and that's for AWA and um, I was kind of going back and I was going to be doing a new kind of book for um, Dark Horse um, but then about two two days later after that I got the message you know put your uh, pencils down for, you know it's on hold for the time being yeah. so um, I've been doing commissions instead because I've had in the past I've had a lot of people asking me to do commissions so I'm taking the time now I'm free to do commissions which i'm really enjoying yeah they look amazing i've, I've seen a lot of the ones going up recently yeah the, the yeah. rasputin hellboy yeah, yeah. 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 amazing yeah. <laughs> I've, I've got to ask then the dark horse job was that in the mignola verse i can't say ah! i can't say Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> i just noticed actually uh it's a year since yes EPRD. i know yes yeah. april 2019 yeah, and it's weird. It's weird. It took me, when I finished that book, I think it took me, if I'm honest, it took me about a month to kind of get it out, get it kind of, right. get it right. It's like ending the relationship. I've been working on that book for seven years. Right. Totally. So seven years of not having to worry about any other work. Seven years of just getting to know these characters in the way that they walk. It's almost... So- like what clothing they've got and things like this, if you see what I mean, kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. the way that they think. And then suddenly it's, it, it ends. And the weird thing was I got told the ending about three or four years ago. And, you know, I was kind of like, oh, my God, this is amazing. <laughs> I'm going to draw some of this. But I wasn't allowed to tell anybody then. Right. And, it, but it, and then I drew it, drew it to the end. And then it almost came as a surprise to me in this weird thing. And... You know, kind of, I I got offered, if I'm honest, some other work, kind of in the middle of it, but I just felt at the time I needed to step away to to clear my head. Does, it, does mm-hmm. that make sense? As it were, to Do you know, I had that as a question, fully enough, because I was talking to my wife about something similar. I, I had down as right. a question: Is it easy to start a new project with a different genre or feeling that's mm-hmm. required? Do you need to get into a different headspace? When you're right. moving from, say, something like BPRD, which has, you know, more of a kind yeah. of sci-fi horror pulp to, yeah. to to old haunts, I was thinking of particularly, because that's got a modern day kind of crime. Yes. Very yeah. much slicks like Michael Mann gets mentioned in the previews a lot, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's I mean, all that kind of like the Michael Mann stuff, the crime stuff. Me and Robert touched on it a bit with um, when we uh it's good. well in when we done uh, what was it called? Um, uh, get uh, get castle. Re- re- reading space. Reading oh, space, right. 2000 AD, and that was kind of like a sci-fi uh, noir kind of thing, and that's where we kind of had an understanding that we both like Michael Mann and things like this kind of thing. And then I got to do some Punishers later on, and that had the similar kind of feel, feel, and that's where the widescreen which we used in old haunts. Uh, Garth Innes used to like, um, like the, uh, the, using the widescreen panel for Punisher Max. Right. So we used that again on that. So it's was, it was kind of all familiar territory of where I wanted to go. And I knew kind of things I wanted to do with it. But it was more kind of, 
recovering, I sounds daft, but recovering from BPRD because it was such a big event in my life. Yeah. Uh, but it was good because what it does, it gets you to kind of like use other muscles and things like this. Do you see what I mean? And uh, Totally. Yeah. So it's, it, it yeah, builds up another excitement, as it were. It's, it's really interesting that, that you do bring that up because I was thinking it's, you know, whether you just have to kind of decompress, whether you end up just kind of just slowly drawing the world that you're going to be there, living in for the next five issues, which right. always haunts us. And does it, does it help that I suppose it doesn't exist? So you, you have to design the characters and you've got to design the, I suppose that kind of eases you into it a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, there was a slight mindset as also because like for the past well, five years while well, drawing um, like Hell on Earth and then the last part of uh, BPRD is kind of um, I constantly was aware of destroyed buildings and things like this because of like <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm drawing and then suddenly in this I'm drawing I'm, you know buildings are a big part of Old Room Yeah. Zero and the features that the writers really wanted to get across, but they're not destroyed. So I was having to kind of like say, no, Lawrence, they're not destroyed in my head. It's like you got to look at smart, slick, beautiful, beautiful buildings at night, you know, all being nicely lit. And that 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 became, you know, the, 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 the lighted sit the the lights and the city became almost like a monster of the book. As it were. Do you see what right. I mean? It's, it's, it's like the ghost of the book, but it's also like the monster of the book. So where you draw the monsters in BPRD and the destroyed cities here it's kind of like these hopefully kind of mysterious but beautiful world kind of thing of la at night because it virtually the whole book takes place at night so, right which is yeah which was a joy to do as well well I'll tell you well let's go back a little bit because uh it's like you mentioned it's for awa studios so yes. that's a new company isn't it that was set up uh yes sort of end of 2018 i think something like that i think i read on wikipedia I think it, so was. it was set up by alex alonzo who was the ex-editor of marvel comics bill Jemus, Jemus. Bill, bill Jemus and axel alonzo axel. right um, yeah axel was my editor uh at marvel on right the and um I, I worked for him in, i worked with him uh on punisher for about well he had that and other jobs for about five years and then I went off to Dark Horse after that kind of thing. But Axel was always kept in touch. And then he got in touch with me privately on Twitter, funny enough, and said, you know, kind of, when you're free, would you like to come and work? And, um, you know, kind of, I, it was kind of, as I said, BPRD was coming to an end. I've got a lot of time for Axel. He kind of really helped me out when I was starting out as a kind of, a, like a, as a fresh artist. Where, you know, yeah. Kind of encouraged me to ink myself. He taught me a, kind of like the deadlines he's got he's a fountain of knowledge and he's a good guy as well so the opportunity to work with him but then i was also getting the opportunity because that's when at the same time um uh rob williams and ollie masters come to me with a book that it was getting the go-ahead of awa called old haunts and rob i'd worked with about three or four times before and ollie i got to know because when i moved uh from london to whitstable um, he came to a, fun, a Punisher sign in saying he wanted to be a writer. And uh, no. very quickly, very, very, very quickly, he ended up getting a book at Vertigo and that got turned into a film. <laughs> yeah, that's the kitchen, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Amazing. So he's, he's, his career, yeah, just went <laughs> back kind of thing. God, so there's something in the water things. down there. Yeah, fifth and neck. That's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> I've read... There's some really good preview material, actually. Um, um, all of the books, well, not a lot of the AWA books have been made available uh, in a kind of preview form. They're kind of in a episodic kind of webtoons form. Yes. Do it from from the AWA Studios website, and each of them come with a a, a little page by by the writers talking about influences and how it got done. And the one that um, Ollie and and Rob wrote. There, who's got some, you know, great information about the start that they both shared the same idea they found on a, on a chat and they both had the same idea in their notebook. Right. And I, I, over a chat, they found out that they had three old gangsters haunted by their past crimes. Literally was a kind of shared wow. idea. That was one of the reasons yeah. why I decided to, to do it together. So, yeah, you've That's done right. you've, you've worked with Rob uh, a few times in the past as well, haven't you? Yeah. 
Yeah, I worked on, uh, as I said, for 2000 AD. I've done a couple of dreads with him as well. Um, then we worked, our, both of our first job at Marvel was a Wolverine. Rob wrote here, and uh, I drew it. And then he'd done a, a Punisher Max um, kind of one-shot kind of thing, where he took uh, Frank Castle to Wales, yeah. which was a great episode. I really enjoyed that. It's amazing, fucking it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an amazing one shot. I, I reread it for the right. interview. Yeah, he's in the Brecon Beacons, which yeah, is about yeah, 45 minutes like, up the road from us. Yeah, so it's right. really... it's a corrupt SIS, man. Yeah, that, that was good fun. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so Old Haunts, we now get, get back to the, the idea of, you know, it is, it's a very urban sort of crime drama, isn't it? There's. Um, mm. There's these three old gangsters that uh, get introduced. And then by the end of the story, you realize that just when they're trying to sort of get out of the life, there's something that won't let them forget what they've done. Yes. Uh, I've only read, I think, of of the ones that are available, there's only about five episodes online of Old Horns. But we do get to see, uh, and in some of the preview material, we get to see the, the vulture which is yes. well we don't know if he's real or not do we but it's a it's a very creepy exactly. creepy yes. character well for me it's kind of what's that tv show um true oh true detective true detective that's yeah, it. yeah 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 now the first um the first series of that yeah that's got a slight supernatural touch in it but I've realised a lot of that, that the supernatural... I was wanting more of a supernatural touch. So was I. I was reading that there was more supernatural touch than there was, is the way that I was doing it. Yeah. And I love that feel, and that's the kind of feel that I want to get in this comic. Yeah. So there's kind of like, what is this kind of creepy, weird creature kind of thing? Is it real? Isn't it real kind of thing? And we, we, want, we want to play on that, as it were, kind of thing. And, and uh, yeah, that's one of the few things that, should we say, go a little bit weird. Oh yeah, yeah it's it's thing. it's frustrating yeah. the you know the 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 bits you get in in the preview. Mm. Yeah, you're getting a lot of the feel. Obviously, because it's uh, it's not a standard comic page, you're having to obviously realise that it's going to be presented differently in the book than it appears yeah. on the on the webtoons. They've chosen to do everything in the kind of thumb scrolling mobile way, which you know at the moment when there's you know little content being come out coming out it's you know still great that you're actually being able to see what the potential is but you know it is kind of quite frustrating when you know it's not how it's originally been drawn on the page so the pacing is 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 slightly off on some of these things and there's kind of repeats of panels or um it's having to be sectioned off but the actual creepiness the vibe of the like you're saying of the city as as being a character itself really comes through on some of the visual you've got this i mean and um i have to say uh lee Luffridge. Luffridge? yeah Luffridge, yeah he's, he's done an amazing job on it's, it. isn't it you know yeah. i mean no, no, no. Some of... well please oh. yes, no, I, I think i'd worked with lee before but i wanted a certain type of look on this book because i said it's all it's about the city as it went yeah cities. yeah and it's as i said it's based it it's all at night kind of thing and i wanted I don't know about you, but when I kind of kind of go into cities and I'm driving through them at night, kind of, and there's something quite haunting about them, and we really wanted to capture that. And Lee done an amazing job. I sent him a few images of things that I kind of liked, kind of thing. Right. He, he came back and coloured the cover to the first issue, and just by doing the cover, I thought he's nailed it. He, he, you know, he's, we've we've got it, kind of thing. We know where he wants. I'm really pleased with the colouring on this. He's done a great job, and it, it just works for our. Yeah, I, I would say that this is probably the book that i've probably the closest i've worked with the colorist as well so there's a few right. working with the writers on this they had shall we say like uh there's certain themes that will appear in the book again and again and again and we've we've highlighted them with colors like certain colors as well because i know that um it's kind of uh robs into this thing um another tv show where they use a lot of yellow right uh, Better Call Soul, I think it is, where they use oh, right. yellow. Yeah, and um, it, yeah, so we, we, we're using certain colours, as it were, to kind of uh, to get to get certain meanings across. I think it's fair to say. Because it starts off in a in a bar, I think, in the preview, yeah. which is called Man's, which is yes. you know, 
bit of a that's, nod that, to, to one of the yeah. uh, sort of style uh, uh, references that gets mentioned in the previews a lot. Michael Mann. Yeah. And uh, even even in the bar, the kind of the glow always seems to appear from below. So yes. that gives everything that kind of slightly off kilter, slightly, you know, um, yes. demonic. We're, we want to make it shadowy, we want to make it quite noir kind of thing. Um, I mean, I think one of the phrases was like neon noir kind of thing. So you've got all the lights of the city. and the Yeah. Thing. So it's got this kind of dark, brooding, menacing, almost, we want something as if something's, something's, something's brewing in the story and it's going to come up kind of thing. So in the first issue, it's all about it, it developing, as it were, kind of thing. And like these three friends... You know, kind of, they've been together through a lot. They've seen a lot together. And that, that, later on, that's going to cause some stress, as it were, kind of thing. And there's, you know, and that, that's going to bring things to a head. So, yeah, the, the, mm. it should start building up. I remember when I read the script to, issue was it? I think it's the, the second issue. Yeah, this, I read this, uh, the script to the second issue, the beginning of the second issue. Uh, Rob and Ollie have written a great, great, Great three or four pages at the beginning where the the pace where you're where you're being taken along as a reader and you don't want to go but you've got to go because like you're reading the book as it were and they do that so well and it's quite amazing. So are all five issues done and dusted? So you've, you've got all more. Done. Than yeah, I've seen them. They're all, they're all done and coloured. So as soon as we're kind of back to some you know, kind of comic shops up and running again and people publishing and things like that. Hopefully it'll be out there in in, a, in the comic and graphic novel format, as it meant to be. Yeah, I mean, um, so in terms of the process that you went through with um, Rob and Ollie, did oh. did they have the script finished, or were you working with characters and that kind of influenced the script, or? No, they. Had, I think they had the whole thing written. Right. I, yeah, when I, when I came to it, the they had the whole thing written. The only thing that kind of changed when I came on board was. I suggested that we do it widescreen because I said, oh, you know, kind of it brings that kind of Punisher Max kind of widescreen feel to it. It kind of makes it kind of a bit movie like is what, is what we were trying to get across on this book. And um, you, they're not hard and fast rules, but you really kind of you really want just like five five panels, widescreen panels on the page. You can get away with six, but you really can't do any more of that. But because they're widescreen also, you're kind of limited to the amount of word balloons you can have on it. It's not like a vertical panel. You can see what I mean? It's a horizontal yeah. panel. So you can't have too many people talking at once uh, where you've got a balloon, somebody else talking, and then the original person talking with a balloon because there's no room for that. Mm-hmm. So you have to break things down a little bit. So I think they went back, readjusted some of the text, so that worked. Um, but then after that, yeah, we were flying kind of thing. So I've done some quick character sketches of all the characters, made sure that you could identify them throughout the whole book, as it were. Because mm. they're, they dress, they're, these are normal people, so you've got to recognise them as, you know, kind of out of an ordinary crowd. Um, but yeah, no, it, it seemed to work okay. I love Primo. Yes. In the book. He's based on uh, uh, my wife's uh, dad. <laughs> <laughs> my father in law, who I did, when the first time I met him, he's a, he a box trader. <laughs> so, right. So, a lot yeah so, yeah that's who he's based it on <laughs> I, I said I, i've got it written down i, I love for you you've got a slabby kind of x boxer look that's exactly there we go yeah and yeah. in one panel i think i did see him walking towards a kind of uh, training yeah. bag I think, in the background yes. but yeah. oh, he, he's yeah. he's like a proper yes. yeah he's, you know he's, he's, he's yes he's got a big old hand you put your hand in an air to warfare kind of thing he is the kind of the tank of the group i would say really but again yeah. he's older as well so you know his views kind of he might still be hot-headed but he maybe he can't do what he'd done in the past but i think that's probably rob's favorite as well actually all right yeah he, yeah. Just, he gets a lot of great close-ups as yes. well for yeah. yeah and he yeah. has got that kind of craggy kind of look to him yeah. Yeah. i did wonder because it is you do tend to i think imagine some people in, in in some characters just to even get a kind of vibe off them like you say so that you can kind of imagine how they walk or you know uh, just what their kind of gait is sometimes yeah but um i know sometimes now it's quite easy to sort of cast sort of well-known actors into roles 
yeah. one of the other titles that I was reading as part of this, that it was the, the flagship title of AWA. It's one that Mike Diodato's drawing, you know, the oh, resistance. Yeah. He's yeah. made um, he's made Ed Harris president oh, of the USA post. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. and I'm a huge Westworld fan. So as soon as as soon as he oh, pops yeah. off, yeah. I'm not thinking about the book anymore. It's like, oh yeah, yeah I've got Westworld to watch tonight. You know? <laughs> <laughs> It's it's probably better to be able to use relatives or people that other people don't know. It doesn't, yes. doesn't take you out so much. I, I think they put down when I, uh, when I got the scripts. I think they had brief like who would play who, as it were. So they had kind of ideas on who would play who. And again, what I did was I, I took the fill of that rather than the look of that. If you see right. what I mean. But my concern was making sure that you could view them against other people so you know kind of i think that they've virtually all got gray hair uh like you i gave one a beard one a kind of a goatee kind of you, know, you just have to make them identify but kind of Primo was the one with the busted nose that, <laughs> that, kind of, that works. and then you got the vulture as well which has got a very creepy design you don't see a lot in there There's, they do put um in in the previews they put a lot of um sort of images from future issues Right. Don't know what's going on, but it does have a kind of trailer feel to it. So there's some oh, okay. action involved in there, and there's you know, oh, yeah. so you get a lot of a feel of what the kind of basic book's about. But it also has that kind of um, silence sort of um, trailer feel to it. It's great. Right. So yeah. that bird makes more than one, should we say, more than one appearance, kind of. Yeah. Yeah, it's there haunting. And you've so. got this motif of like, um, is it nickel and dime sort of? Yes, that was. I think that might have been Ollie's idea, Ollie Masters' right. idea. Um, that, yeah, that's kind of at the beginning. But again, that plays plays. You know, that's that's seen a couple of times in the book. There's there's I say there's a few little themes that just keep appearing as it were. Kind of. Yeah, the first thing I thought I, re- I remembered there was an old Daredevil villain called Copperhead, and he used oh, right. to he used to leave copper coins on oh, his did he? on his victims' right. eyes. That's what that was the first thing I thought. But I know it's a uh, there's a kind of mythical connection to Sharon, I think, with with those. Yes, there is about pain. Yes. Yeah, pain, pain right. across, yeah. which all yeah. fits with that kind of um, yes. passage that they're trying to to get yeah. to. Where's so I mean, I was going to say, what we're trying to do is is kind of we're trying to get a balance of a uh, kind of like a crime book and a horror book. Yeah. And when when they first said that to me, I was kind of like, oh, I like the idea of that, but I think it'd be, I think it. It could be difficult getting a crime person to kind of uh, take them into a horror, you know, like like what you said about the bird type creature. Some people, well, I'm hoping that people will see that and go, you know, what the hell is this? You know, where, where did that come from? How does that fit into this story? And not be too put off by it, and you know, go, and willing to go with it. And I think readers, I think crime people are willing, are kind of, are open minded enough, hopefully, to follow that through. As it were now. I think so, especially like you've mentioned, there are um, more blending of ideas that happen yeah. with things like True Detective, but also Fargo. Yeah, you know, true. yeah, which yeah. is a, a, it's a brilliant crime TV show, but every every now and again you get such a left turn in that program. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yes. And yeah. you know, I yeah. think true. I think I don't think it's going to be a problem for for readers to be able to just take. Uh, take the idea that there's something and not necessarily assume that just because it's a comic, this thing yes. represents, you know, uh, a, a monster, you know? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So what kind of reference were you using first? I mean, it's, is it set in LA? So it's like, it it's is, mostly it at night. Yes. So you've got kind of a three people from the UK. <laughs> doing <laughs> um, Downtown Whitstable. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, but the, the scary thing is, is like some of the shots um, were like some of the there's there's a scene, some scenes where they're driving around LA at night, and I just went down to Whitstable at night, and I just took photographs of that, and I just what I was all you need is like a hook to work from. Yeah. So like the glow glow of the windows was the thing that I worked from, and things like that. Do you see what I mean? So oh, that um, occasionally in the in the scripts, uh, Rob and Ollie would put references of certain places of where they're going to go so quick google so if you can find out roughly where that is um yeah and you know kind of get yeah, google maps or google earth kind of thing you can you can find out you know part areas but it's also i think it's really important as an artist to if you're going to use reference that's fine but you don't i personally don't want to be 
too stuck on the reference because I feel like if you get too stuck on the reference then sometimes you can kill the imagination that I think so it's a, it's a balance between the two yeah it's it's making something recognizable and getting an impression but without yes. feeling that you're looking at a, a yeah, yeah kind of a a google image or yeah something yeah. like that isn't it yeah uh, yeah yeah. And, and I suppose with that, because it's not period piece, you know, you have got an ability to, uh, you know, set things in a modern era, yeah. which, you know, the, there's a general style to that kind of bar that you can. Yeah. Simply... I was reading yeah. Sean Phillips's art book and he was talking about how he'd used a box set of the Rockford files when he oh, was right. doing Patal. Because, right. you know, it's like 70s America. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that yeah. would be a lot more of a kind of. Yes. You've got to you've got to pull a kind of era out of you. Yeah. I, I I could totally see if that makes sense. To be honest though, I I, I would, I'd be happy to watch the Rock for Foles even if I was. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, found on TV that I've got me delighted about. I found old episodes of Kojak recently and everything else, and I'm like, oh yeah, this is heaven. So yeah. I did I did I was really jealous. I saw online somebody was saying, oh we got um all the series of Columbo free on Amazon. Right. Like, no way. That's, that's amazing. But it was America only. Oh no. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Yeah. I, I honestly thought, right, that's my lockdown sorted. Yeah. No, exactly. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and are you working completely traditionally? Yes. It, you know what? It's one of these things where I haven't got a Cintiq, but virtually everybody else that I know has, and I'm also starting to think like. Oh, if I've done a, if I work in a Cintiq, I could do it like this. And I'm starting to think like how to use a Cintiq, but I've just not done that jump. And the main reason I've not done that jump is because my computer setup is ancient. It's about 15 years old, all the equipment I've got. So if I buy one new thing, I've then got to do that thing of buying everything else new. So it's that case of like, if I'm going to jump, I've got to really commit on the jump, as it were. So, yeah. Yeah. And- more and more, you, you kind of get forced into it. I mean, I had to upgrade. My wife is a children's book designer, right. and it was getting to the point. She was on Windows 7, and the Adobe software itself that yeah. she needs to use to, to carry on working with the company that she works for, that was just not allowing her to, you yeah. know, upgrade. It kept saying, yeah. you know, like, you got to upgrade, and you can't upgrade to the latest version unless you've got Windows 10, I think. Exactly. That. Yeah, so you get so, caught in that situation. So, and I find that incredibly frustrating because I, I personally feel like it doesn't need to be like that. That's just the way that they're just making money. Frankly. Oh, so and, and you know, how much do you actually use in some of these programs yeah. as well, to a certain extent? I mean, I've been using Photoshop all of my professional career, yeah. and I yeah. don't think I've really changed any element of, of what That's, I use it for. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's all these extra bits added all around the outside. <laughs> <laughs> you still use the core bits that you that, that when you originally learned it. Anyway. Yeah. So this is what I'm saying. That I think if I do it, I'd have to I'd have to kind of really invest in a whole new kit, and I've also I'd have to kind of re-educate myself as it were. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, there is some when when drawing is going well, I do love drawing on paper <laughs> because yeah. one of the things that I do is I make a lot of mistakes, and I love I you know kind of. It sometimes it would be frustrating, but that kind of random brush stroke that I do is really quite nice. And I know you, you these days I've seen what you can do on the Cintiq, and you can get the lovely brushes that do that stroke. But there's something quite nice about doing it by hand and then getting the tip X out and like building it up and things like that. I do quite enjoy that, I must admit. It's interesting, the amount of people that have got Cintiqs that still ink the pages naturally. So yeah. they, they're using it for layouts, they're using it for pencils. But then they print them out and actually still ink a traditional way. There's still something quite beautiful about that. Mm. But I do understand. I do need to go over. Oh, it's not that you do. You, your work's amazing. <laughs> 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 but no, I mean, it, it's just an interesting thing because there are so many different variations on the way you can work now. Because, mm. like you say, that a lot of people are doing digital pencils and then printing them out to ink. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, all coloring pretty much is is. It's done that way now, but I mean, you can still, you know, get uh, commission pieces and watercolors. And yeah, so, um, you've been watching the drink and draws as well, haven't you? With the, oh, uh, yeah, the, this is one of the things about the kind of well, the lockdown or whatever kind of thing. Of, I, 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 I never really used to kind of 
uh, like listen to stuff like that kind of thing. But now I find myself I'm listening to them. I find them fascinating. The oh. stories that they tell on them and the guests they've had, they've, they've been great. I really know good. it's such a great hold to fall down, isn't it? I was yeah. I was watching the Howard Shaking one. Yeah. And oh man, that guy just he's he's such a breath of fresh air in so many ways. And you know he he, he knows his stuff. Fifty years he's been working in the business. Yes, yeah, you know yeah. knows what he's talking about, but yeah. and has a very distinct way of saying it. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're gonna listen. <laughs> oh, but yeah, just seeing them, just watching somebody else sitting there uh, while they're uh, while they're drawing, and and you know Dave Johnson, he's yeah. just you know the machine, you know he just yeah. hardly needs to stop, you know it's yeah. crazy. He, he he does literally every week, isn't it? You don't see his yeah. face, he just goes for it kind of thing, and he's just like drawing. Just seen his hands, I know it's crazy. Yeah, but it's good stuff. I mean, and the stories they tell, the, the, the like the old stories that they tell, I just find fascinating. You know, kind of the shaking one. Well, he's talking about, I think he's talking about Frank Miller kind of thing. It's just like, it's brilliant. The stories he was telling kind of thing. Just yeah, like, his, his studio, you know, talking yeah. about he's being in the studio with Kaluta and Wright. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. I t- oh, there's another podcast, actually. Have you heard of the Felix Comic Art podcast? I I, I know, of, like, the kind of the, the website where you can buy art. But is that, do they do They've too? got a podcast as well. Oh, okay. I'll tell you what, and in terms of, those kind of stories there's a couple of people they get on they've got i think um oh they've got who's the idw um guy who does the uh he does the art books he's the one of the oh, scott dumbia yes yes there's an amazing one with uh scott dumbia oh, uh, okay. tells, tells an amazing klaus jansen story there's a right. whole one about um dark knight returns and the oh, original really? art, how the Dark Knight Returns artwork ended up on the market. Wow. And, and there's occasional uh, stories about kind of falling out be- between collectors because one guy sold a piece. Uh, I think it's the Mazzuccelli Born Again cover, oh, yeah. you know, with a stained glass. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. One collector sells it to another collector. And then Mazzuccelli finds out that that collector's got it and basically says it was stolen and wants oh. it back. Oh, my and God. You, We've got a whole story back yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, all those kind of, I think... Um, but you know what I also come across on those is the love of comics. Yeah. Like, the, the deep love kind of thing. Totally. You, know, like, you know, they're, they're in the business, and, you know, some of these people are now, you know, as you say, they've been doing it 50 years, or they're incredibly successful. But you listen to them talk. They are talking as if they're just like, you know, kind of, me when I was 12 years old, but you know, kind of the, the excitement of the 12 year old kind of thing. You see what I mean? And I love that. I love that they've kind of, you, you can still see the passion there. Totally. Yeah. I mean, and that's, it still drives them. It's still something that, you know, it's still something you would be doing, you know, mm. really. But, uh, yeah. And this, and this, there's a lot of them, you know, out there. I mean, that's one of the best things about, I've only just discovered the YouTube bit. Because that's kind of like the late night kind of when right. I have a bit of time of my own, I can guess. Yes. And I was always a bit sniffy about YouTube. It was like, yeah, yeah, no, I'm. That's what my right. daughters do. Yeah. <laughs> that's such a such an yeah. old man approach. No, 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 I'm with you now. Yeah. All it takes though is that one thing, and yeah. it's like, oh my god, this drink and draw stuff. This is amazing. <laughs> and then you're staying up late to watch it. Then it's like yeah. trying to get everybody off to bed so you can have a bit of your time. <laughs> Because that's the other problem about lockdown is because you've got to, you know, you've got to compromise about what you watch at lunchtime. But then it's kind of like, yeah. right, can can everyone go now, please? Have we got to have a kind of like um, a play your joker, <laughs> isolation joker? Oh. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yes, we did mention. Oh, the other th- actually, there was one other sort of slightly TV sort of connection. Have you seen the um, Nicholas Winding Refn? Does he's done an Amazon uh series it's got it, it's kind of got a similar vibe in terms of the sort of bright colors and the what's, kind what's of it nighttime it's a brew baker one um too old to oh. die young no i'm not but um, it's got a similar vibe in terms of visuals you know right. yeah okay it's uh, you know was, sean has mentioned this to me yeah uh, works with him kind of thing and he yeah, said that yeah. he's seen it so i will check that out yeah that's it's on not, amazon yeah, I um I started to watch it with my wife and she found it too slow. It's okay. quite it's got a quite a strange pace to it. Right, it's got okay. a great sort of LA nighttime vibe to it. Yeah. Kind of, you know, uh that I mean it's 
it, it was when I was looking through the preview, and there's that bit where um, I think they're driving in a car. Is it Alex is drunk? And there's, oh, yeah. there's this really brilliant kind of smeary reflection on the car that yeah. I take it Lee must have put on then. So because it's just it's just it's just this perfect mark of smears and it's yeah it just is, is it like, the lights going across yeah yeah i've done that so yeah oh yeah, yeah. so um, you're oh so you're putting some of that stuff on as well it's not all down in color is it the, the, it's literally the colors the, the the if you're talking about the white lights um, yeah yeah they're not white but they're colored but they're like the the reflections of the is it when they're in the tunnel and they're like the I lights so. are, yeah 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 well yeah that was that was i was in the car and we were going in a tunnel and I was looking at like um looking at the lights hit the, the window screen kind of thing because I knew that this story was coming up and then I was sitting in the front room and we had the blinds up and the blinds done the same kind of marks I noticed so I took a photograph of them and then I manipulated right. and I put them in yeah so that's what that is um, okay so but it's... yeah that kind of I, I'm very much interested in the, the reflected lights on on the faces in the cars as it were and that happens again throughout the whole book yeah oh, it's, it is it's, it's it's gorgeous so because of the setup of awa mm. is there kind of one eye on potential tv or movie adaptations i i i, I if i'm honest i think there certainly is with us <laughs> i don't know about the rest um <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, you know, kind of, yeah. I, I, I think, I think every company is now aware that comics are being used as a resource or some sort of another totally. for probably films or TV shows. I mean, and the weird thing is, it's like some things that you just never expect to be a TV show are now, you know, being seen in some way or another kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, I, I think there is certainly an eye for that kind of thing. But it, it wasn't, it wasn't totally written or drawn for that as it were i mean certainly the way that i've kind of i've drawn it um although i've used the widescreen format you know it's it's, it's done it's 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 been written as a comic and it's been drawn as a comic yes That's totally what it is yeah Whether it gets turned into a film or a tv series that'd be amazing but my focus was the comic as it were. yeah so. yeah the, the 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 idea of making a good comic always comes, comes yeah first, that, really. yeah yeah totally because it's, it's just not not right. Yeah, it's, it's, way, it's, it? it's its own format, as it were, kind of thing. And you know, you kind of yeah. So you know, it's not a book of just talking heads. There's you know, there's plenty of other stuff going on. I mean, uh, there are other, as I have said. So for people who want to check it out, this is on the AWA Studios website that all of the preview materials are available. So it would have been released uh, on the sixth of May. Yeah. I think I think you were due. You had a Forbidden Planet sign in it, didn't you? Yeah, I know. It was, it was all, all drawn. Without, you know, I was able to go to the sign without having to worry about getting back and doing hitting deadlines or whatever else, and then crash. And then, yeah, yeah. isn't it, it is crazy? So, it's yeah. just a diff- suddenly it's yeah. a different world. Yeah. It, yeah, it totally is. I mean, we talked about, you know, a year on from the end of BPRD, and it's mm. sort of hell on earth in, um, <laughs> <laughs> in hours. But, yeah, um, yeah that's so true. You, so you don't quite know really what's going to happen release wise, do you? Because uh, obviously physically it's not going to be released on the 6th mm. of May, but no. um, I know some of them have been released on Comixology, but you said yeah. they were the ones who were released pre lockdown. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know whether this is going on Comixology I, or whether they're just doing it on webtoons for now kind of thing. I, all I know is, is that you know, we've been told that, once things get back to some kind of normality, it it's going to get released. Yeah. So and well, that's, that's, that's my concern is I want it to be released as, as I saw it kind of yeah. looking at. Yeah. It, I mean, it is, it's definitely, uh, there's definitely a difference in the, uh, the web tunes, mm. web tunes presentation that you can see it's not how it was originally supposed yeah. to be released, but equally, you know, it is nice to have some new material that, yeah. you know, yeah. Uh, as yeah. a reader, I, you completely understand and completely want to support comic shops. Yeah. You also want to support the industry and, and your, your favourite creators. So um, I would go and encourage people to look up uh, some of these previews. Webtoons, 
there's, there's an amazing kind of uh, amount of people that actually go go to yeah. that. Site. And if I'm honest, you know, I hadn't heard of it really beforehand, but an amazing amount of people that go there. So if it brings in a new audience or, you know, that the webtoons people decide that they want to check out comics or whatever, you know, like you know, comic books, as it were, then that's, that's, that can only be healthy. Yeah, definitely. I mean, some of the other ones on there, I have to give a quick shout out to um, E-T-E-R, which oh, is yes. written by Jeff McCompsey and uh, the art by Javier Pulido. Pel- yes. Pulido. Oh, man, it's so good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, really, I really nice. I, I really enjoyed that. There's only a couple of episodes of that up. Yeah. And then there was one that was a real surprise for me as well, because I'm not a big zombie comic fan. Right. But there's uh, Year Zero. Yeah, that's really nice. By that's Benjamin really Percy. Yeah, ah. really nicely looking. Yeah. It really does. And that's one of the, yeah. I mean, it obviously still, it kind of works a little bit better than a lot of them, I think. I think right. it just, might have just been looked out in, in the way it was, it was drawn. Yeah. But the art by Ramon Rosanos. Yes, yeah, and nice again, one. I mean Lee Loveridge on the colours. Yes, yeah. every there's there's it kind of concentrates on five uh, different characters across the globe. I think it's five, but each of the different locations have a kind of different colour scheme, mm. so you yeah. know distinctly sort of where you are. Somebody yeah. in Japan, there's a kind of prepper in the states. I think somebody in Mexico, and the colours on that again are uh, are absolutely amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, encourage everyone to go and uh, I think uh, it is awastudios.net, I think it is, that's got the previews for them. So, yeah, I mean, all we can do really is just um, be patient and yes. wait and see what happens. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. See what, what the landscape sort of turns out to be, because it has made me think of the different sort of shakeups that the comic industries had to deal with um, over the years. Uh, you know, when you think of the 50s where you had the kind of Senate hearings mm. and then you got, I suppose, the next biggest one was um, the, the actual rise of the comic shop themselves. Yes. Yeah. True. Which, yeah. which led to, you know, the, a lot of the companies now like Dark Horse and um, IW, IDW, Boom. So the smaller independent uh, publishers, really, that didn't exist before the comic shop was there so yeah, very true yeah it's had a massive impact the fact that they've existed so hopefully whatever happens whatever impact the comic industry uh, ends up having to deal with you know um i think comic fans are you know passionate enough about the medium that yeah, I, I think people will still want comics at the end of this. So hopefully the demand will be there. It'll just be a case of, yeah, you know, there's going to be a, like a few changes on the way kind of thing. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, I still think the demand will be there. I'm hoping there will be. Well, in the meantime, go and look up your favourite creators and uh, tell them you'll wait. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, You'll be there <laughs> in your comic companies. Brilliant. Well, listen, Lawrence, it's been an uh, absolute pleasure chatting. Thanks so much for uh, for for um, appearing. So, if people do want to um, catch up with you um, on your on your socials, yes, uh, Twitter, Get Campbell, and Facebook, Lawrence Campbell. So, yeah, that, that's it for me, really. And those two. Brilliant. That's awesome. Cool. Room for one lawgiver, please. Ah, Judge Dredd. Or is it just dread? Fancy seeing you here. Catwoman, you also here for the Comic Art Festival or a stint in the ISO cubes? Of course. I love to see my makers in action. Ah! Watch it, Greenie! Careful, Hulk. In this town we have a saying. Once is a coincidence, twice is a booking offence. <laughs> I think he booked the events on the website. Huh? Comicartfestival.com It's got all the perfect information about the event. Yeah, so's my fist. Druck, I'm out of here. Not standing around with those four tortoises that have just entered the building. Cowbunga, dude! Find out all about the Lakes International Comic Art Festival and booking information at www.comicartfestival.com. 
With us today we have Jordan Thomas. How are we doing today? Hey, I'm all good, thank you. How Excellent. are you guys? As, as good as we can be. Yes. Based on the situation. <laughs> um, so, tell us first of all, before we go into the reason why we're here, which is um, the Quarantine comic, uh, which is coming up on Kickstarter today, I believe. Uh, yep, it's uh, going live at 7pm UK time. As we record on the 30th of April. Yes. Uh, tell us a bit about your comic history. Um, so I did a few stories for the Cadavers anthology, which came out a couple of years ago, which was another uh, big project with a lot of different artists on board. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was my first kind of published work after a few attempts previously. And then my big thing has been the Frank at Home on the Farm miniseries. That was four issues with the final one uh, got funded about a month ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they were all successful, so that was really great. And, uh, yeah, the digital files for that all went out to people yesterday with the uh, expectation I'd be posting everything pretty soon. But I'm actually <laughs> uh, stuck in Spain currently, so can't get back oh. to England at the moment to fulfill that quite yet. I was about to say, gosh, unlucky you, but that is quite unlucky to be stuck in Spain at yes. the minute. That's no way you want to be. How did that? Was it, was it just on holiday or visiting family? Um, How was that? No, I, I kind of live here most of the time. Okay. Uh, but I do all the fulfillment stuff from from England. It's not like an exciting, fancy holiday home or anything. Mm. It's just my normal apartment and then all of the comics are at my mum's. <laughs> <laughs> going back home to uh, to the spare room where all of the, the back issues and stuff are kept. Okay. okay. So how's it been over there, though? Uh, yeah, I guess it's pretty crazy. We I'm in the south in Granada in Andalusia. Mm-hmm. And they, we've not had it as bad as places like Madrid and in the north. So okay. it's never felt, it's like you were reading all this stuff on the news and seeing like how Spain's in this awful state. And to be honest, in my day to day, I never really, it didn't feel like I was in the stand or anything, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, obviously it's kind of strange, very quiet as it's, they're pretty, um, loud party people. Like in the April, they have this great big festival normally where um, hundreds of people go around carrying giant statues of Jesus and the Virgin Mary through the streets. Okay. It's impossible to go anywhere. Um, but yeah, obviously, all well, that's been on hold. So a little bit strange. Um, and Frank at Home on the Farm has been uh, really successful as well, hasn't it? It seems to be from, well, I've read a few of issues of it, and it's it's certainly engaged with people, the story. Um, how did you find the process for Kickstarter with that? Yeah, I really enjoyed it, actually. Um, the Kickstarters are funny, and they're this weird mixture of um, of nervousness and excitement mm-hmm. the whole time, where it's pretty much all you think about for the whole month that it's yeah. on, and probably the month before as well. Um, but yeah, it's been really cool. I get amazing messages off people saying how much they love it, and the reviews have been really good, and the backers have kind of consistently gone up till mm-hmm. we got to the final issue, when it was by far our most successful one. So that's always mm-hmm. good. If people kind of come back and new people join, you're seeing there must be something decent in there. Which gives you a good stable um, for the next one, a good stable base of people. So your new comic, Quarantine, tell us a little bit about that. Um, yeah, so Quarantine, it's a 40-page one-shot comic, and we're doing it in prestige format, like the Frank Miller Dark Knight Returns kind of style. And it's me and a huge number of artists all telling a, it's a coherent story, you know, it, it's all one story, but mm-hmm. with a different artist drawing every page. And the basics are that one day this apartment building finds itself surrounded by a bunch of scientific equipment, then there's a zap, and, and the building gets transported into an alternate universe, and they're just stuck in quarantine with no idea why, no information kept in their apartments by these guard bots that patrol the halls and things kind of get weirder and weirder from there. I think um, when I sent the script to Derek Robertson, who's doing the cover for the project, Mm -hmm. he referred to it as kind of like a especially messed up Rick and Morty episode. (laughs) So I guess, yeah, that kind of vibe. Um, So how did you decide on the artist for each page or was it just a random, here, you take that one, you take that one? Um, well, I went through a few different ideas. So in terms of how the, the project kicked off, I was just sat around like in isolation looking on Twitter and I saw a few of the artists that I'm kind of friendly with on Twitter mm-hmm. posting art back and forth being like, oh, you know, I've done this. What are you doing? And so I, I got the impression that 
although they're not like didn't have nothing to do there was maybe a bit of a window in terms of time on people's hands with all this going on so reached out to a bunch of people uh guys like russell mark olson gustavo vargas donna a black and they all said yes so i knew once i had them on board that i should be able to get a lot of other people because people really respect them and know how good their work is um so once i kind of had a big biggish number of people i did consider doing like a lottery where we'd film it <laughs> and like the fa cup or something and pull out the page number and then the artist but i thought probably although that would be fun for the video um it was probably better that i assigned pages so that you know we saw the best of everybody involved and i also wanted it so we didn't get too many similar people back to back like you'll probably see from some of the promotional prom- promotional material that there's a kind of big creature by the end and i wanted to see like rosie packwood drawing the great big creature as well as people like gustavo and things like that so i kind of really sat and thought about what would be a really cool order to to go through the book like what would be a cool juxtaposition you know so i've had a look you sent me the the files from some of the early the work which is amazing actually just looking at the creation process and seeing how people are, are starting the work on and then hopefully see the finished design at the end that'll be really exciting mm. um how did they work did they just go for it or did they work with the the people either side of the pages to, to make it a bit link in a bit better how did that all work uh that's probably been my favorite part of the whole thing is that i um <clears throat> i set up a slack channel yeah. If you people know what that is, just like a kind of file sharing messaging service where you can have all these different channels. So we've got like the Kickstarter channel, the pages channel, the design channel. Um, so everybody's been on there chatting, which has been really cool because like we've got a couple of pretty famous guys like uh, Gary Erskine, uh, who's did like Hellblazer back in the day, which is one of my favorite ever series, and um, Shaky Kane, who did covers for the Grant Morrison Doom Patrol series. And some days I'll go onto the Slack and Gary will be on their chatting process with Russell and Gustavo and they'll be talking about the pens they use and stuff that goes completely over my head <laughs> as a non-artist. But yeah, everyone kind of really got involved with helping each other. So someone says, oh, has anyone drawn Peter's bedroom yet? And then Andy W. Clift pops up and goes like, yep, here's my what I've done for the bedroom. So then Ahmed Rafat knows, okay. So these posters need to go here. This bit hasn't been seen yet. So I'm thinking of sticking this lamp there. Okay, that works. And so, yeah, it's been a super collaborative process, which has been really fun to uncover. Yeah, that's interesting mm, that. I like that. Yeah. Um, obviously, you've also got superstar Pete Taylor involved. Yes, we've got to say that. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be upset if he wasn't mentioned. Uh, and to be honest, Pete's page is absolutely incredible. Yeah. We had a little, so Pete, uh, he delivered kind of his rough and then me and Pete had a bit of a chat about the big panel in it and slightly changed a couple of things. And when it came back, I was like blown away. Absolutely fantastic. Like anyone, like you obviously people know his silver beard work Mm -hmm. and I kind of channeled a little bit of silver beard into it in a way that I won't reveal here, (laughs) but maybe once it's out there, we can talk about it. Um, but yeah, he's done a fantastic job. And finally, you mentioned the cover, the uh, cover, Derek Robertson. How did you yes. uh, go about getting him involved? Um, it's kind of random in that I, I, at first I had had ideas for doing a cover where everybody drew a bit of it, mm-hmm. which is an amazing idea that I quickly realized was going to be an absolute logistical nightmare. <laughs> and I've already kind of, you know, it's been great fun, but a fair bit of work already. And I think that probably would have been a step too far. You know, some yeah. some guys are super busy, so it's going to be harder. So we settled on just having one cover artist. But I wanted it to be a different person to who'd been in the book because we'd really stuck with that just one page per person idea. Uh, I spoke to a couple of different people who have some contacts fairly high up in the comics world. And obviously people are quite busy. And so a couple of those didn't work out. And I absolutely love Derek's work. He's one of my favorite artists. Like those Transmetropolitan and the boys covers are just incredible. So in the end, I just sent him a a tweet, just being like, hey, Derek, this is the project. Would you fancy doing the cover? Um, Send me a message if possible. And a couple of days later, he messaged me. And then we chatted a bit on email and he said yes. 
Oh wow! <laughs> Twitter is the best place for stuff like that. Yeah. We've yeah, had that, haven't we? Kind of like I had, um, I had like uh, Shelley Bond, you know, the famous editor from mm-hmm. Vertigo, like asking people for me, and they were all too busy. And then it was just the person that I actually just sent a tweet to, who ended up being the person <laughs> who he's done it. And honestly, like Derek's just one of my favorite artists, so it's incredible to get to chat Brilliant. to him and uh, see as he kind of works on the cover. And he's a super nice guy as well. So yeah, that's really cool. It's excellent, absolutely superb. Um, so the Kickstarter itself, have you got any stretch goals you can uh, cheekily shout out now? Yes. So the first stretch goal is that we're going to add the page by Gary Erskine to the digital and physical copies of the comic. So Gary's been involved in looking at stuff. He knows what he's doing. Uh, so hopefully we can hit that stretch goal so his page can be included. Mm-hmm. Then the next one is adding Shaky Kane to the comic, who I mentioned earlier as well. Again, he knows exactly what he's doing, so he's ready to come in and do his page. Uh, and it's just a case of hitting the stretch goals so that we can actually add them into the books. Yeah. And then after that, we've got an Ian Laurie print. I don't know if you guys know Ian. Yeah. He's pretty yeah. prolific on Twitter. He does some really cool stuff. So he's done an amazing print that will go out to everybody if we hit the 4K mark. And the final one at 5K is that we're going to add four more pages to the book, which is going to be kind of back matter material. Like the the Slack is absolutely full of people doing like character studies and page designs and just kind of mood board type things as they tried to get to grips with what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So we've got loads of amazing kind of making of back matter stuff, which will be in the book either way. We'll probably have about six pages of it currently. But if we hit that final stretch goal, then we'll add another four pages of that stuff. Super. Fantastic. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. So that's launching today as we speak on the 30th of April. When does it go on till? Uh, it's a 32-day one, so it'll <laughs> Come just on, count, count. May, <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, and I assume just go and search for yourself or just search Quarantine? Yep, um, on Quarantine um, on Kickstarter. If you type that in, you should find it in mm-hmm. comics. Or I'm Jordan underscore J underscore Thomas on Twitter or ampersand 1988 on Instagram. So there's links to the comic on all of those. Plus, I'm pretty sure most people listening to this, they're going to be following at least one of the artists Mm -hmm. on the comic. So they'll all be hopefully posting about it as well as I kind of corral people (laughs) into trying to do marketing. Um, but yeah, it should be great. Super. Well, we'll add a link to the show notes as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so go and have a nosy. Um, and if you passed the date when you listen to this, when it's all over, usually there's links on the Kickstarters that are linked to be able to buy it separately. Are you going to release it separately after the Kickstarter? Is that the plan? Yeah, I'm sure um, something like that will happen yeah. in the future. I've, I need to figure out how things like online shops and stuff mm. like that work. Mm. But I'm sure eventually I'll have so much stuff that I'll have to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it won't completely disappear. Superb. Thank you so much for your time. Well, and thanks, good luck. Guys. I really enjoy the show. So nice to come on. Oh, we Aww, like that. Thank you. <laughs> I do welcome to Motor Downs, the yakking endlessly about comics section of the podcast. I'm Pete Taylor. I'm the creator of Silverbeard. Online, I trade as this man, this Pete. And as always, the mutterings will be supplied by Mike Williams. Uh, I'm online as at Cthulhu Punk, uh, fanboy and generally pressured into doing this. <laughs> so how's uh, how's life under lockdown been? Well, let's look at my isolation diary this week. Um, yeah, strangely enough, um, same as you, I'm still working. I work from <laughs> home anyway. Um, and I've got lots of friends that aren't working. So I'm getting pressured into <laughs> halfway through a conference call. I'm getting texts to say, jump on Call of Duty or Battlefront now. Or uh, can you run a, can you run D&D on Roll20 tonight? It's like, no, I need two days to prepare for that. No, I can't. Um, so it's been box sets, really, is how we're relaxing of an evening. Um, best so far is we've just finished Penny Dreadful. Oh, yeah. Um, which we, we've, we've actually watched it start to end a few times now. We absolutely love that series. Uh, and I wanted to look up something on the last episode, so I went on to IMDb, to find out that in a few months' time, there's a new series. 
Cool. None of the originals cast bar one. Um, and it's um, fast forwarded into sort of 30s America. Mm. Um, very noir. Ooh. So that's why I thought I'd mention it to you. Ooh. It might be Sounds supernatural good. bent, of course. Mm. But it's, um, yeah, it looks looks very interesting. Um, and, of course, we had a Star Wars binge. So already in for this weekend, on Saturday, we'll be watching The Last Jedi in 3D in preparation so that we can watch Rise of Skywalker, which arrived yesterday, <laughs> in 3D on Monday, Star Wars Day. Oh, of course. So uh, that's what we're looking forward to. <laughs> yes. So you've been busy as well, haven't you? Oh, I've been absolutely frazzled this week. Uh, the work... It's been a little more pressured than usual because some of the publishers that I'm working with produce seasonal material. So uh, because of that, to hit, you know, Halloween and Christmas, you've got a camera ready date that artwork has to be ready for and supplied to the printers. Some of the printers uh, are... Still, well, most a lot of the prints are still going, but some of them have got reduced staff. Uh, and obviously, some of the precautions they're having to make to their own working methods, I think, is slowing some of the production down. Uh, having a few sort of issues with even some supplies uh, running low for, for some of them as well. So it just makes the job you're doing a little more pressurised that it's got to be complete and out there for the time that, you know, uh, they want it. Um, so yeah, a couple of late nights. Um, but all that means is that my uh, usually absolutely spotless presentations on Lots of Downs is going to be a little more shambolic today, but I have not, I've not quite done the amount of reason reading that you and me like to do to, to get into uh the meat of the genre but as the ever expanding feedback corner is showing us <laughs> <laughs> there are there are people out there listening mike the, there are i know we're struggling with a name for this now reoccurring section <laughs> um feedback corner seems, seems to be what we settled on but, yeah, but I, i'm also going to suggest whinges and well wishes because <laughs> that's the two camps it comes down to or uh, everyone's a critic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's it's been we we did uh, we did do Star Wars. Uh, we are currently enjoying box set wise uh, Castle Rock, which is available on. It's one of these add on Amazon channels, but there was an offer on where I think you could get about three months for ninety nine p. Oh right, so you looked at that actually. Yeah, really yeah. enjoying it. Great cast. Uh, it's got Scott Glenn in it and Sissy Spacek, and uh, we are Stephen King fans. We read a lot of his his novels, uh, obviously not all of them, so we don't know half of. I'm sure the uh, the references that that are um, are popping up, but yeah, really enjoying it. So that's a nice one that we're managing to fit in. Still getting together at, at certain points. My daughters are both have uni and and coursework that they're cracking on with so that's generally helped when you have got everybody working it does feel like you know you're going to do a good day's work and then flop in front of the telly at uh, at night but yes it's been a been a funny old week and then yeah. and then of course i've done my i've i've done more than double podcast uh podcasting this week of course i'm i'm all, I'm all over this episode <laughs> this, this is the p episode isn't it <laughs> I don't, yeah i don't know whether i'm talking before or after my star turn but i uh i had a chat with uh lawrence campbell on tuesday evening which was absolutely fab i'm a huge huge fan as everybody knows i bang on about bprd and hellboy and uh managed to have quite a chat with him without really mentioning either of them which uh oh wow okay I did, I did bring up towards the end that it was a year it's actually a year since bprd ended i reread yeah april 2019 
So uh, I, I, I couldn't get through the entire conversation without uh, some some fanboying. But yeah, it was interesting. Obviously, Lawrence is at the sharp end of what's happening in the comic industry. So he had been told to um, to stop work. So uh, it was interesting to be able to talk to him about a, a project that he just completed. And I you know, don't like to speculate at all. It's, it's very early days. We, we don't know what's going on. But we did have a little chat and we thought that there would be uh, still a desire for comics at, at the end of this or whatever comes out. I suppose it just depends who's there to supply them. So yeah. that's that's the question in place, really, in, in all forms of whatever industry people are involved with, is there are going to be uh, some uh, companies that manage to to keep going and some that don't. But we, And we really don't know what, what that situation is. But certainly with the amount of creator-owned uh, comics and companies and even just self-publishing i think there's definitely going to be uh, a market still in place yeah yeah it's, but you can't get um, through to see yeah. what the new world looks like a little bit yeah you can't it doesn't the take too without... much of a break does it really to for businesses to go under unfortunately yeah um, and on top of this and the lawrence campbell I'm also involved in the uh, quarantine comic, which we've mentioned previously, that I think is, is, as we're recording this, me and Mike, it's 20 past six on the 30th. I think um, in about 40 minutes, the Kickstarter for quarantine comic is going live. Oh, wow. We can cover that live if you remember. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, back it live. So we're now on what are we group C. Yes. Oh, are we doing no? We're doing um, feedback we're corner. Feedback corner first. I was just going to mention actually, with talking about the comic industry and book industry in general. Um, Humble Bundle. I'm not sure if you've seen this. So I've pasted it everywhere I could. Um, they're doing a Walking Dead bundle, which is every single Walking Dead comic ever, including all the free comic book day things. The um, the Here's Negan uh, break off as well. Um, and it's supporting um, the Book Industry Charitable Foundation. Cool. Um, which is, you know, charities that you need to support right now um, before we come out of this. Um, it's an absolutely amazing bundle. And we're talking for like £14.50 is the minimum donation to get everything. Cool. Um, which I think to get a digital collection of that size. Amazing. Is, it's just amazing. It really is. So, um, sorry. Yeah. Feedback corner. So, uh, I believe you've got some <laughs> off, off Twitter from our compatriot, <laughs> Tom. <laughs> yes. So it was great. So it was great after the, the, the episode is launched to get feedback from our, uh, fellow contributor, Tom Stewart. He's, uh, always, Bless him. He's always one of the first to finish listening he is, to the yeah. episode, which is fantastic. Because one thing I've been finding is my podcast listening is really suffering. Even though I'm probably walking more regularly than I used to, um, I'm now taking my walk with my wife. So we're out for you know the full hour, we're doing, and it's a good old brisk pace that she's setting. Usually it's a lot faster than my than my <laughs> stroll, so we're getting we're covering some ground. But um, she's not insisting on talking to you, is she? Well, you so know, you can't listen to podcasts. That's just rude. I can't listen to podcasts, <laughs> but there is there's this also there's the advantage as well is that you know uh, living as we are as a family, it's it is quite nice having a little time you know, to ourselves and having perhaps a, an opportunity to let off a little, <laughs> a little steam. Uh, but, but yeah, podcast suffering. I, I find uh, I'm actually spending longer in the garden. I hate gardening, but I discovered the other day after mowing the lawn and I hadn't finished the podcast I was listening to that if I did a bit of weeding, I could finish 
the podcast I was listening to, <laughs> which is unheard of. I was voluntarily gardening <laughs> just to fit some more podcasting in. But uh, yeah, Tom's always, always on the ball. Uh, and he came in with uh, some extra info on what we were discussing last episode, which was the non-fiction versus horror. And I was talking about, oh, actually, no, this is um, TV adaptations, because he's, he's telling us about End of the Effing World. And it came out as a self-published piece before it was with Fantagraphics. And uh, his mate Dave was telling him that he used to be able to contact Charles Foreman, Forsman directly and mail him the cash and he would send you the series, which is how <laughs> I believe Fantagraphics first got hold of it. So, wow. proper, yeah, proper old school for it to start off that way and, and become the, the the media machine that it's become. Uh, and then also on the nonfiction front, Rather more formally, dear editor, Scott McLeod, Understanding Comics is a straight winner. As soon as that is brought to the table, all bets are off. It's like playing certain cards in Cards Against Humanity. <laughs> they automatically win. The comic that inspired so many comics and explains comics in its entire creation wins. I look forward to your apology and redaction of the results of this poll plus my usual fee of £200 for pointing inaccuracies. <laughs> Your pal, Tom. Well, I hate to think of the bill that we are racking up if he's charging <laughs> us for pointing out inaccuracies. I, I don't want to go back through the Twitter feed, because bless him, you know, uh, he's he certainly knows his stuff and... He's, he's pointed out some of the emissions, I think, particularly on the Western episode, that pre, pre-feedback corner, yes. which we, we were slow to, to bring up. So I think we'll probably go back over some of the the, the losing uh, results. And perhaps, like he says, we'll, we'll look at some of the uh, some of the poll results and see if we need to re-examine any of them. Because we were talking about at the end of the effing world. The, the, the series because it was on Channel Four to, on E4 I think I saw it but the 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 um, central character um, uh, James uh, Alex Lowther is the actor he, he mentioned about the fact that he's in um, a Black Mirror episode have you ever seen that one I've seen I think I've seen all the Black Mirrors it's the one about the lad that's sort of being bullied oh. online. I do which remember. we can't go into for spoiler no. reasons and other reasons as well. Yes. It's a phenomenal episode, and it's, it I think yes. they're all WTF episodes, aren't they? That's the whole point of Black Mirror. But I think our jaws dropped when we realised what was going on. Yes. The most of any Black Mirror episode ever. It's a quite a shocker that one. I think I remember my daughter actually pointing out uh, after we'd finished that who who it was. It's quite distinct oh, actor, isn't and it? What, a quick mention to um, Mike Turner, who uh, got in touch to say that, uh, well, he got in touch and and mentioned that he was listening and enjoying the World Cup of genre. <laughs> so thank you, Mike. <laughs> Excellent. Um, again, uh, the fact that Western, as you mentioned, losing didn't go down very well. Um, <laughs> uh, Richard Sheaf got in touch. Um, you'll know more about Richard from from last episode with Ian and Nikki. But um, uh, Boys Adventure Comics Blogspot is his thing, uh, where he kind of looks at UK comics of yesteryear. But he sent a great little article he wrote for me, um, which is basically an analysis of uh, in, uh, Western comics of the fifties. Um, it's only a short article with lots of really nice sort of pictures of covers and, and strips included to illustrate what he's talking about. And it really does do an analysis of it, uh, of, of the number of titles and everything that were coming out. So I'm going to put that up as an article uh, on the uh, Comic Art Podcast um, website, um, which is comicartpodcast.wordpress.com. 
um, which I should imagine is how a lot of people get to the episodes anyway, although we're still on iTunes, yeah. we, but I think a lot of people go through straight to the site now. Um, yeah. So I'll do that as an article uh, on there. Um, and thanks a lot, Richard, for that. That's, that's really cool. I wouldn't mind getting Richard on some time because mm-hmm. it's very knowledgeable on uh, comics of yesteryear. <laughs> so, uh, I'm glad yeah. somebody is. <laughs> 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 oh, I do feel like that sometimes. Flipping heck. So are you ready to start Group C then? Yes. Uh, just to explain, in case you haven't caught the uh, <laughs> the previous groupings, uh, we're doing a World Cup of comic genres. So we're kind of um, doing uh, these. These take the form of matches where we kind of make a case for the genre, talk about it a little bit, um, sometimes the history, sometimes just the highlights of what, what we think. Um, and then we end basically by doing a penalty shootout where we do a quick explanation of titles to play off against each other, and we vote as to the winner, and that basically gives us a winner of the, the match. Um, and it's really more about us trying to bring things to people's attention, really, isn't it? It's an excuse more than anything else. I mean, yeah, apart from the excuse to yak about comics, which we're always after, we do uh, discuss the genre from from uh, whatever historical perspective we can. Sometimes it's not always the easiest uh, aspect to talk about. But, yeah, it's, it's really talk, from my point of view, I hope to bring some hidden or lost gems to people's attention. And along the way, there are just some that you can't ignore that, you know, people will have heard of. But whenever the genre comes up, you've got to to um, highlight them. And in today's uh, case, uh, it, it's definitely I've, I've, with the lack of preparation time. I've definitely come back to the well on <laughs> quite a few of some of these, and I've probably already banged on about a few of them in the past. So apologies if I am uh, flogging a dead horse on some of these titles, but man, it was quite a week. <laughs> <laughs> well, so far we've seen Crime Beat Western, the most unpopular result yes. to date. Uh, we've seen uh, Romance Beat Sport. That's right. We've seen Post Apocalypse Beat TV and Film Adaptations. That's and we've right. seen Horror uh, Beat Nonfiction. And the categories for today are Fantasy, War, Sci Fi, and Adult. Ooh. I mean, that's a pretty humdinger, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, in terms of categories. Yeah. I mean, and the, the we have talked. Ones when we've been organising the episodes of how big some of these genres are. I mean, some of the, the, the big cheeses, you know. And in terms of sci-fi, war and fantasy, they are definitely some of the some of the genres that have variously ruled, you know, the the comic book market at, at certain points, it could be argued. Right, so <clears throat> I'm holding up some paper. Do you want to choose the left or the right? The right. Sci-fi. Okay. Left or right? Uh, l- left. It's sci-fi versus war. Ooh. So what does that leave? That leaves fantasy versus it leaves adult fantasy. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, sci-fi. I'll tell you what. Let me start on this then, because I'll get my my rambling, disorganised thoughts out. Sci-fi. I mean, it's got such a strong connection to comic books. Um. If you think about how many of those leading lights of the golden age of comics actually had their start in science fiction or science fiction fandom. Um, Julius Swartz was um, the literary agent for H.P. Lovecraft. 
think if I remember that right, before he became, you know, um, one of the leading editors at DC and one of the editors that championed, I suppose, science fiction in its pages. Uh, he was in charge of um, Mystery in Space with um, Adam Strange and the Strange Adventures sort of anthology book, which was that kind of highlight of the 50s era of uh, of science fiction. But it started off in the Golden Age. The Golden Age had your pulps, so startling stories and those wonderfully oil-painted covers. So that's probably, you're talking about the 1930s. You've got Book Rogers appearing in uh, newspaper strips. I think he, that was from about 1929. Uh, you had, although apparently the, the honour of the first science fiction comic was Mr. Skygak from Mars. Have you heard about this? No. I think it's from like the 1910s. It's a single panel sort of gag comic. So it was a single panel appearing in, in the newspaper. It's, it was a strange kind of uh, almost a Mr. Bean type alien that was struggling with its um, definition of the of the world and um, working out what what how the world worked. I think those early days, science fiction was something that was popular. Superman himself had an early iteration in a science fiction text story, which was where the Superman in question was more of a kind of despotic sort of supervillain, super scientist. So, yeah, 50s, outer space, spirit. We've got Wally Wood, of course, and EC Comics are perhaps the next highlight. Like I've mentioned earlier with the DC Comics and you've got Adam Strange, you've also got Wally Wood's kind of classic, besuited astronauts visiting the most amazingly abundant planet and the amount of detail that he would put into the space that those gleaming chrome spaceships that was a real highlight of of the of comic books of the of the 50s coming into the 60s so now we've actually got a sort of reflected era of actual space exploration so we're, we're talking sort of post sputnik and yuri gagarin i think that becomes reflective in a little more the Fantastic Four famously head up, headed into um, orbit before Americans landed on the moon, which they do um, highlight in a 60, 1969 issue of Fantastic Four. They, they point out that the rest <laughs> of humanity is caught up with the, the Fantastic Four. And then you've got, for me, Kirby, who is almost the epitome of comic science fiction. It was a driving interest of his and drove most of the concepts for the initial Marvel Universe. And if, if you do read, there's a number of articles, particularly the Jack Kirby collector, that put forward the idea that it was Jack Kirby who was the driving force of a lot of those early um, Marvel comics. And the driving ideas behind them were all scientific. So you have got radiation being the prime factor behind the birth of most superheroes. A lot. Yeah. yeah, mutations, but also you've got the popular mechanics that he would you apparently he had a vast library of uh, scientific journals that he would keep in the same the dungeon he called it the studio where he, he did most of his drawing. They found some of their ways into the montage is that he would include in his work. I suppose modern day comics have taken science almost the realm of fantasy in mm. the belief now that science can pretty much do anything when you look at some of the future visions in books like paper girls where we have the far future envisioned as being a lot more encompassing in terms of its control over space time we've gone much further into the capabilities of what science fiction can do in comics now than perhaps what early pioneers of science fiction might have envisioned happening. So highlights of examples that I thought of for science fiction when I was putting this together. There's a book called Strange Science Fantasy by mm. Scott Morse. Did you did you pick any of those up? 
No, um, <laughs> it came up a lot in my research. <laughs> for yeah. Other, um, some previous episodes that I've done, actually. It's, I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge Scott Morse fan. He's worked sporadically in, in comics, really. I picked up, most of the stuff I've picked up by him has is, is purely been based on the style of the artwork. He's got very brushy, very textural sort of look to his work. And he's written these strange science fantasy books as well. They were published by IDW and they they kind of almost have a different genre in each issue. But strange science is at the heart of them. There's a character called the Flashlight, which is a bit more of a kind of 50s sci fi there's a character called the projectionist who's got um, a movie camera for a head and that's a bit more of a film noir kind of style. There's Gigantic, which is a, a war kind of theme with a twist. But Scott Morse is doing some directing work for Pixar nowadays, but he'll still occasionally pop in with some weird and wonderful sci-fi stories. So if you haven't picked up Strange Science Fantasy, it's definitely worth it. Absolutely gorgeous artwork. What else? There was uh, Xenozoic Tales. That that must be right up your street. That's a post-apocalypse uh, bunch of stories by Mark Schultz. Oh, I recognise the name. I'm just Googling now. There's an old bind-up that I bought back in the day called Cadillacs and Dinosaurs. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And it's got a it's got a very old school vibe to it in in um it's a real mix of sort of pulp and movie serial sensibilities so it's a it's a future version of Earth after various uh, cataclysms. Oh right yeah 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 sorry I'm with you now. Do you you know, yeah, yeah, I've read yes. <laughs> so there's a lot. I didn't of realize kind of... there was like a a, a a rebranding of it. That's why. Well, it was the yeah. name is instant like oh right yeah. <laughs> yeah, Xenozoic Tales. It was. It's been. I think it's been printed by quite a few different companies along the way. I bought it from when it was first collected by Kitchen Sink Press, but I think at different points Marvel and Dark Horse might have had. Yeah, they had. Yeah, yeah. But it's. You know, it's it's a real it's it's one of those you've got 50s cars mixed with mutants and pterodactyls, T-Rexes. You've got flooded cities with, you know, gangs. So it's a real mix of kind of Planet of the Apes and uh, post-apocalypse sort of sci-fi. Very much a land of the lost vibe yeah. as well so if you remember the american tv series yeah. there was um there was a um cadillacs and dinosaurs role-playing game that i remember when i was a teenager that we we had a, a go at i think it was, was it using twilight 2000 rules but yeah it was i remember um that quite fondly actually it's got um it's got an introduction by al williamson in it who uh has, has produced a fair few tales of this ilk himself, um, and that shows the sort of calibre. But it was uh, written and drawn by Mark Schultz. Yeah, if you haven't caught up with that, it's lovely, gorgeous artwork. It's a little reminiscent of sort of Dave Stevens. It's got that kind of very brushy, sort of polished sci-fi look. It's got it's very, it's just got a very 50s sort of sci-fi vibe to it, and uh, Cenozoic Tales great example as i mentioned you can't really have science fiction without kirby i think i love the fact that he was so inspired by science fiction you know what really gave him his first fire in the belly to to draw and explore these these worlds was when he saw a a pulp issue of a science fiction magazine it was being um, carried along the gutter and he managed to catch it from from the stream of water before it was pulled into the, the the grid and lost and the idea of him being inspired by this you know throwaway science fiction mag uh, he he was drawn into it by the cover and then obviously inspired by the writing inside 
And, you know, what would the comic industry have been like if he hadn't managed to save that magazine from the from the sewers? So um, what would you choose in, in sci fi terms to represent Kirby? I mean, um, Eternals is is great and relevant with the upcoming um, movie. It's perhaps um, not as coherent as stuff. It starts off. I always thought it started off like gangbusters. And I think you mentioned in um, a previous episode how it didn't really tie in to the rest of the the Marvel Universe. He wanted it to be standalone, but was encouraged to, you know, to tie it back into the, the rest of the Marvel Universe. And perhaps that didn't didn't help. But I've gone for um, New Gods, which is Kirby's. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if it's the the main book in the um, in the Fourth World series. It's I always felt it was kind of the linchpin of all of them because he'd left Marvel under a cloud, started at DC Comics in the early seventies, was somewhat given carte blanche and expected to produce the amount of kind of new material that he had at Marvel. I know this was when he was throwing ideas in, you know, such as um, romance titles, divorce books, uh, bringing back gangster um, stories. He was famously said, you know, when they said, what do you want to do? He said, give me a lowest selling book. And they gave him Jimmy Olsen. I think they were surprised at how strange that turned out to be. But it, that was also what he used as his lead into the Fourth World books, which were Mr. Miracle, Forever People, New Gods, and it was Jimmy Olsen, wasn't it? That was the fourth one. And it is really is Kirby at his mad science fiction best. Um, there's absolutely glorious double page spreads there's a, a famous story called um, the glory boat which has some of the best kirby artwork around um he throws all of his um creative juices into coming up with um well, dark side first appeared in this where we've got um the Orion Gang and the Deep Six. So if you want full on 70s Kirby greatness, I would go for uh, New Gods. Um, pulling from my pile next to me here. I was going to say, I always find that this, the, the, these things kind of got reprinted later on as like the secondary stories or the titles I find. Yeah, especially with the Kirby Marvel stuff, like they were trying to force it into the mainstream Marvel universe. But I, I do remember New, New Gods as well getting reprinted somewhere. So I've definitely read bits and bits of it. Yes, I mean, um, I remember started there, didn't he? Yeah, I remember. I was quite lucky that when I first discovered comic shops. They would they were doing these special editions where they would package previous, you know, well known work like Green Arrow, Green Lantern, some of the more critically acclaimed comics, and they would put sort of like two, three issues into one um, sort of Baxter paper, better print quality um, bind up, and New Gods were one of the ones that were available in that form, alongside. You know, things like uh, early um, Len Wein, Bernie Wrights and Swamp Things. So you could actually get a really good basic education on some of these these stories just because uh, the, the comic shops were able to, to put direct market material in front of you. Uh, more recent. Oh, well, I did. This was nearly in both for the longest time. I thought I could halve my workload. <laughs> <laughs> this was how uh, it is one of it is uh, the epitome of um, adult comics for me to a certain extent, which we, we will get onto. But um, 
game changing comics uh, you can't really come up with one that I think influenced the, the medium more than um, uh, certainly in the 80s um, Howard Shakin's American Flag it's without this book you wouldn't have had you know Dark Knight in the same um, terms as it was it was hugely influential in terms of its look uh, graphic presentation uh, typography famously having um, sound effects that were taken from I think the chorus of a, a soul song at one point there's um let's see if I can find it there's the the plex ranger firearms that he has have a very distinctive sound effect every time um, it's fired here we go yeah pa 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 ooh mao mao which is uh distinctively <laughs> traded each time i mean it is i mean i was a i was a wannabe graphic design student i suppose at this time i eventually went into graphic design and illustration and man it's it's all over the book and then in terms of story it wasn't a story for um you know kids it was about social and political corruption it's set in 2030 in a future that if you read it now it doesn't seem like it's far wrong uh that humanity has reached mars but if i remember rightly that's become a haven for the rich and um nothing much has changed for the proles left on on earth all of the characters are most of the time quite self-centered and horrible (laughs) and out for everything themselves um and it's down to ex porn movie actor ruben flag who becomes a, a plexus ranger to become um, the hero of the piece. It's elegantly styled. It's so sparkly written. It's adult in terms of its um, depiction of sex and, and less so violence, but it's just like everything... I will get onto it in terms of adult comics, in terms of if you want to read something as a grown up, then pick anything up by Howard Shakin. And as a grown up science fiction story that influenced how stories were told, put together and what the expectation of a, a, a good comic story could and should be. It's absolutely incredible. I was hoping to be able to read it before, uh, to reread it before today, but that got away from me. But I will definitely be doing a deep dive into it. I've never read it, but I really wanted to because I think, I think it was when I was doing, oh, I was trying to go into the back work of Alan Moore, and I think he wrote some stuff for it. He wrote, yeah, and I couldn't find it anywhere. All right. And that was going to be my into it, I guess. Really. Yeah, yeah. He, what happened, I think, Shakin must have drawn it, uh, written and drawn it for, I want to say, uh, maybe it was about 18, 20 episodes. And I think he was writing it and Mike Vosberg was drawing it. And at some point, um, Alan Moore wrote, I think, a two-parter. And it was, I remember it as being the sort of bridge point between Shakin actually leaving the series as a sort of creative contributor. So I think he might have had an, you know, editorial, um, conduct and he was perhaps involved in steering it. But at that point, I think somebody else came in to write and Mike Vosberg carried on drawing it. So it was, um, I was interested to see what he did because I, I think I was trying to prove the the point that Moore used to come in and just do like a quick one shot for yeah. this comic or a couple for, but he'd always do something major. Mm. 
So he, he quite commonly came in, completely shifted the tone or made some kind of catam- cataclysmic sort of like uh, change to something and then walk away. <laughs> and he did that a few. And I, w- I was wondering whether this was going to be an example. I think that's why I was trying to get hold of it. I think, yeah, I think uh, he, he ramps up the sex, I think, in it. Right. I think he... Because he would take advantage, I think, sometimes of the opportunities that a, a different book in a different company would give him. Alan yeah. Moore. So I think he, if I remember it rightly, um, he 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 ramped up the the sex. I can't remember who drawing it wasn't wasn't um, shaking, but I remember. He, I mean, he did um, episodes of issues of Spawn. He, mm. Alan Moore, you know, yeah. he would he would he would drop in and. Um, and join in, I think, to to a certain extent. Uh, so yeah, I mean that's one of the best examples of eighty sci- sci-fi that I could think of. I I, I went to it straight away. Uh, I mean, a rundown of what's sort of available nowadays: um, East of West, which we missed out on talking about in um, the Western. But I'm I'm going to do an episode on on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just come to a close. I did read the final few issues, and I don't think I've had a clue what's going on the entire time I've been reading it. But I've been absolutely blown away by Nick Dragotta's artwork. But now it's finished, and I do appreciate a series that that finishes. I'm looking forward to going back and maybe getting a, a different handle on it. But it's it's another one of those, a bit like um, Xenozoic Tales. There's, there are some real different styles that seem to come together. So you've got, a, you have got an old west sort of prime theme. A lot of the characters are taking on appearances from uh, the old west, but then you've got this fantastic future tech um, Japanese um influence in terms of the the design of some of the technology as well it doesn't look like anything really uh, i've seen in in other comics uh saga of course which yeah i mean i I'm, i suppose maybe i'm trying to get ahead of tom here and uh, just mention <laughs> <laughs> just mention <laughs> passing as, as many as i can but uh, modern sci-fi uh Saga is, um, you know, beautifully um, written and, and drawn. I did uh, drop off um, perhaps earlier than most, but with the full intention of of going back and, and finishing those. Uh, Paper Girls, of course, which again, something that just came to a close recently. Been very evangelistic about that with my daughters. I think that's something that they would both uh, really enjoy that's a real sort of um head turning uh time spanning uh amazingly put together uh sci-fi piece um yeah did i mention we three earlier but you know we three has got a real even though it's about three animals that have been um modified into uh weapons there's a strange humanity to the story as well um but i need to reread that um and lastly there's a book that people might not have have picked up which is rassle by um jeff smith did you did you manage to pick up rassle mike no I got it. They, they came out kind of oversized black and white. I think they've come out now and they've been coloured. But it's 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 not Jeff Smith does bone. Uh, this one is about a kind of dimension hopping art thief. So it's um, a fascinating world that you gradually get introduced to. Um, it's only 15 issues um it's got um 
strange backstabbing sort of romances involved. It's got shades of um, the Philadelphia experiment, if I remember rightly, and brings in some um, sort of Native American symbology later on. But it's it's cracking, crackingly strange. It really pulls you in and um, it's quite bizarre. I, I don't want to to give anything away but it might be something that people haven't uh, picked up and read but yes yeah, space time nightmares um the titular character attempts to bury bury this research while hopping dimensions to filch paintings and uh it begins to to catch up with him but um yeah not not the best rundown of science fiction, I'm afraid. Apologies for that, but there's enough, I think, um, <laughs> enough potential for people to look up something from there. I'm, I'm surprised you didn't go for the popular vote of just 2000 AD. Yeah, do you know... That was kind of pure science fiction, for the most part, anyway. Do you know what? I've got a very specific relationship with... Um, 2018 for quite a, a, sh- a short period of time really and that's um, it's the kind of Halo Jones era mm. and I think it w- I was able to um, cycle into uh, Latchford, there was a paper shop that was the sort of nearest paper shop to me and I would uh, in Warrington, I'd cycle there every week to pick up 2000 AD and check out the the pile of mainly DC comics that they had by the counter. You knew each place in in Warrington and what you were likely to find there. And I would go once a week and pick up. And this was sort of the yeah sort of Alan Moore era. So yeah. Halo Jones, Dion Quinch, um, Slain I think was just starting then, or was in it then. But oh Nemesis. Course, Warlock. Nemesis the Warlock. The, 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 it's still my golden period of 2000 AD, that. Well, the, really the, is. The, the other comic that I could get from this particular paper shop that I don't think I saw anywhere else was Warrior. Oh, right. You see, we never got Warrior in North Wales, or yeah. I never came across it. This was the only place I saw it, so I don't particularly know why, and I don't have a full run of it, be, you know, for that same reason. Mm. I think yeah i think i've got the first issue but that had that had a, you know that had science fiction stories in there that had a, a sensibility and an adult sensibility in in a, a lot of cases it was certainly racier than 2000 ad well he got into trouble for it in fact didn't it i think that was right. one of the things with warrior um I, th- I think there were complaints in the media and stuff about it right um, yeah i don't remember it at, at the time but i mean it had that had um, axle press button and laser mm. eraser, and he got sexual gratification whenever the button on his his, his chest was pressed. Uh, and yeah, I think I think the first the first episode of of Marvel Man might have even started with him in sort of in bed or some sort of state of undress or something. But in science fiction terms, you know, you had superheroes, you had the warp smiths, which had a very sort of um, Transdimensional sort of uh, slight 2080 feel to it. Um, you had some fantasy in there as well, I think, in terms of um, John Bolton was doing a strip in Father something Demon Hunter. But I mean, that was a cracking anthology book with some strong titles. But 2080, I think once I'd left home, I don't know, I think once I was at uni, I don't know if it was a money thing. I never really got back into. No, that was about the, when I went to uni. That was about the time when I stopped. Yeah. Uh, and then I kind of went back, and I was sort of picking up the Judge Dredd magazine rather than 2000 AD itself. Um, mm-hmm. of which, funnily enough, recently I found a huge pile of 2000 AD of that period, and I'm thinking I never bought these. Uh, and it it seems as if. Me going to university, my sister came back from university and started buying 2000 AD again. 
right. left them in parents' house. Uh, parents complain at me for, <laughs> for keeping thousands of comics there still whilst I'm in my 40s. So I picked a load up and I'm thinking, like, these aren't mine. So I'm going to have to return them to Sharon at some point. <laughs> but I am going to have a read through, actually, because it's genuinely stuff I haven't seen. Um, funnily enough, I, I did 2000 AD for the first ever official podcast episode, uh, of which you were on as well. There was three mini episodes prior to that. Yes. Uh, which was just a us getting on our feet mm. uh, but I encourage viewers not to look up episode <laughs> one because I'm bloody awful on it uh, and I think episode two I did ghost in the shell actually cool. um, yeah and I, <laughs> I must state now I mean in, in this week you know I did hope to look up you know more international examples because certainly in when you've got a genre like sci-fi it's a shame to just stick with you know british it's or too us big. i know comics. it's too big you've yeah. got all the french french is uh, the french comic scene is just bursting with sci-fi and so, some of the best in the world i think so it's so the yeah i mean it's 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 a it's yes it's a very holy sort of uh, uh look and i know in certainly the adult as well that there are international titles that are probably racier than um half of the stuff that i mentioned but um oh if you're not done french yes <laughs> totally no i yeah I mean, it's a funny old week so apologies but okay mike you've got to be able to do better than that <laughs> uh, just a, a it's a visual thing sorry um you on the beer yet yeah? I finished mine. <laughs> <laughs> Just got uh, rig welter, uh, strong Yorkshire ale, Ooh, Ooh, nice. fantastic stuff. Um, that's my new favourite. <laughs> We're Hard living time, uh, in isolation to um, really sort of expand your beer horizons. I found <laughs> yeah. because you're not getting your normal stuff, so you're getting deliveries wherever, and like wow, um, <clears throat> you should see our bottle bin right now. <laughs> oh, tell me about it. I mean, I. I'm, <laughs> We're normally, you know, sort of like a, a two-bag household, but last week it was three. It was all, all bottles. Yeah, shout out to Thomas Watkins, our local uh, Swansea brewery, that is keeping oh, us in uh, delicious yeah. beer. Yeah, we've got another yeah. delivery. We've we've gone through the selection process now, so we basically tried everything that they've they've got to remind ourselves we've had most of them before, but we've settled. Uh, our favourite is. Um, Kuru Idris, so that's it's a the, a dark beer in in terms. It's a little more you know uh, sort of it's been non uh, likened it to Newcastle Brown. Oh uh, right, keeping us in good stead. The local the, my little local shop's quite good for real ale and was uh, knows my tastes. Uh, <laughs> and they should have been a load of um, Marston's Old Arthur, uh, Old Roger. Oh, right. that's really nice. Had a couple of those just sitting watching Penny Dreadful and suddenly thought, whoa, <laughs> they're like seven point something. <laughs> <laughs> whoa. <laughs> Goes down way too easy. Anyway. Yeah. Right. Good. On to war. War. Um, what so, is it good for? Huh? Hopefully something. Some good comics. <laughs> but let's see. <laughs> It's a, it's another one of those genres with a history that's kind of shared with quite a few that we've done already. Um, at the time when superhero, cowboy, romance and crime were sort of bursting onto the comic scene, um, it's obvious that straight war titles did as well, which interestingly um, is pre-World War II. Um, probably the most iconic cover ever um, is Captain uh, America punching Hitler. Yeah. Which actually came a full year before Pearl Harbor that actually brought the U.S. into the war, which I didn't really realise that until I looked up the dates. But No. Um, but so Kirby and Simon and Kirby got um, death threats over that cover as well. Yes. Well, the, because the sentiment in America wasn't what it was a year no. later. Yes. Yeah. It's just that year that made the difference. Yeah. 
Quality Comics, uh, 1941, um, debuted Black Hawks, yeah. which was a ragtag squad of ace pilots of varying allied nationalities uh, operating from their hidden Black Hawk Island, uh, stroke Tracy Island, and they fought the Axis of Evil um, before it kind of went a bit more fantastical. It was quite straight war, I think, um, as, a, as a genre to begin with, but um, I don't, I mean, it kind of got a bit more like huge steampunk powered Nazi fighting robots and stuff after a while, but uh, before they, and then they got acquired by DC in the late fifties, uh, and it kind of got rolled into the DC superhero universe. Um, and like many, um, it actually even got a reboot in the new fifty two. Um, but I believe it was Eisner behind Black Hawk. Yeah, Hawks, was, I thought. It was. Yeah, it was one of the ones he put together. I think in in the the, the shop that he had with um, Iger. So he was the sort of art director and uh, overseer of um, the art side of stuff. And his, I think it was Bob Iger was doing the sort of business side. Right. But yeah, he's. It was also um, later revamped by Howard Shakin in the eighties. He did a three issue, yeah. absolutely glorious three issue um, miniseries uh, reinvention of it, because it had another one of those ebony characters in it, which was. Yeah. You know, a, a bit racist. It was chop chop. It was the. It was uh, of its movie. time is the phrase that we like to use on this series, yeah. uh, which means yeah, absolutely not a technical. <laughs> <plan>. <laughs> I mean, obviously World War Two, um, when America had actually fully committed, um, that was the boom in war comics, really, um, from the American side. Um, but again, there was a very, very common theme with war comics. It was all very fantastical heroics. Um, and although they, they used to portray all the various theatres of World War II, um, it was very extremely patriotic and pro-war, to be honest. Um, but then that's what the American public were sort of hankering after. Mm-hmm still struggling with, you know, like war bonds and everything. So DC really rode the, the wave of war stories, I think, because they had just a multitude of titles. Um, Star Spangled War Stories in, in 52 was an anthology. Um, uh, it was actually what what, <clears throat> what gave us the infamous Sergeant Rock of Easy Company. Um, the comic was eventually renamed Sergeant Rock in the 70s, and it was probably the first war title I read as a kid. Um, it, I remember sort of copies of it in a local uh, bookstore. that, we, that uh, I bought quite a few of those, actually. Um, in 54, Our Fighting Forces from, Ar- um, from Archie Goodwin is just a who's who of the era's best artists. Uh, Kirby um, wrote a short for it as well, um, which featured The Losers, which obviously had a modern resurrection by Vertigo Comics and a very average film as well. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if you've seen that. But again, ultra patriotic, uh, all American men of war um, finished probably the initial lineup of these these big hitters. Uh, Charlton Comics again wrote fictionalized stories of heroism in a very very similar vein again um uh, uh again i think I, I wrote i, I read out a huge list in my cowboy comics but i loved the the fact that their titles were just so simplistic it was fighting army fighting navy fighting air force and fighting marines <laughs> <laughs> uh it's very patriotic one-sided um ultimate war hero type stuff very pro-war and it became part of the, 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 the American psyche, really, a very sanitized version of war. Um, and that's when EC Comics, which we've talked a lot about, as just so big in, all, in setting the mark for all these different genres. They really yeah, broke yeah. the mold here. Um, they had companion titles, Frontline Combat and Two-Fisted Tales. And they really, they just walked their own line, really. Um, Henry Kurtzman started to, to pick the real life horror of war for the first time. 
And although it was fictionalized story still, the stories had a lot of depth and were heavily researched uh, and a lot more realistic view of war, playing on moral ambiguity and really was a very anti-war message. Uniquely, it also broke out and covered historical wars, the, the, the Civil War, Roman Era War. war. It, it was, to me, this is the, the, the start of the sort of the proper war genre mm-hmm. as an expanding just past what's happening around people there and then. Um, as America went into the Korean War, they continued and they actually changed theatres and actually portrayed the Korean War. Um and of course, a country in war, sometimes the the mood shifts. And I don't think they were particularly on for the anti-war message, which strangely, I think, just means that they were kind of a bit ahead of their time. Um, which, I'll, if you think about the Vietnam War, it was very much a divided nation Yeah. by that point. So I think they were just a little bit too ahead of the curve, I think. Um, but shortly after the Korean War, the, the frontline combat and two-fisted tales kind of um, faded away, really. Uh, I struggled for Marvel War comics for this sort of era. Um, the, the Kirby Stanley creation of Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos being probably the main title that people might think of in 63. Um, and I never know if this is a myth or whatever, but I believe that the title... Um, Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos. It was a bet, and I don't know if it was, was it Kirby or Stan Lee, but it was a bet with somebody as to the most ridiculous comic title they could get published. No way, I've not uh, heard that. And that was, that, was, that was his entry <laughs> to that. I don't know if there was other comics involved. Um, but in 73, Marvel did War is Hell reprints of old um, Atlas Comics, um, and that's generally well regarded, actually, as the way they put those together. Um, many DC titles endured and covered Vietnam as well. Uh, a whole array of characters were co-opted into the DC universe over the years. Um, with notables Men of War, Black Hawks, um, Star Spangled War stories, uh, all of which were part of the New 52, even. Um, 60 Watts saw uh, really the British comic. Um, really historical. The first issue of Commando from DC Thompson. Mm-hmm. It's seven by five and a half inch format. I think is it's as iconic then as it is now, and I, it's just staggering, isn't it, that it's still going? Uh, I had to look this up because uh, I, I don't subscribe. But April's issue is issue five thousand three hundred and twenty-six. I mean, they were they were they were doing like three or four a month at one point when I was a kid. Yeah. I remember, I was, you know, in a news agent, I was thinking, like, they weren't here that last week. They weren't, like, <laughs> one a month or anything. It's just staggering. Um, it's bread and butter originally was obviously fictionalised World War One and Two stories. Uh, again, you know, it's a comic. It's about heroics. Um, but I, I knew it was different because it focused on the historical detail, the uniforms, weaponry, the, the locations, and... The military language as well is something I'm very keen on in my military comics. Um, and I think it, it really does stand out. Uh, it had none of the, the sort of American patriotism. Instead, it, it kind of focused on the, and I'm struggling to actually put this to words, but the honour of soldiering. Because it kind of portrayed, I think, both sides sympathetically. Yeah. There was the rights and the wrongs of soldiering. And it mm. was a profession. Um, which is not, you know, an odd take, but um, mm-hmm. because they, I, I know in later years they, they did, well, even when I read it as a kid, it kind of did portray both sides of the conflict, but I know that since then they've done, they did Vietnam, they did Korea. Um, I didn't know until researching that they did the Falklands War. I might go back and try and find those, actually. Uh, and they also did stories that were actually from the perspective uh, of the non-Western side. So the, there was uh, an infamous um, one I've been told to look out for. It's the story of a Japanese pilot. So I quite like the fact that they've evolved mm. a lot more. Yeah. Because you see them and they still look like the original old. Yeah. And I just haven't picked them up, though. But apparently there's been quite a good evolution in them. 
Uh, and it's a great leveler of UK comic fans, I think, because regardless of how old you are or how young you are, you've probably read one <laughs> or a gross one. Um, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid growing up, doctor's waiting rooms and dentist's waiting rooms were littered with dog-eared copies of them. Um, and I absolutely loved that. And I think I... I think I've actually seen one recently in a dentist waiting room is the reason why it came to mind that. Uh, and I just love that the, the, that was where they ended up. Yeah, totally. <laughs> uh, but I noticed also uh, last couple of Christmases, collected editions have been like a um, a dad gift at Christmas. Yes, there's a kind of new retro comic gift arena, isn't there? You know, yeah, Misty has come back. And... Yes. Yeah. I know, I think my wife bought her sister the the Misty annual or, you know, bind up because that was what you'd read when you were you know, my, my sister never read those kind of things. She was also, she was always into, into 2000 AD with me. Um, but, like, John Freeman did some stuff, didn't he, about on, on his blog about the new Misty stuff. Mm. And I, I wouldn't mind reading it again. And I think she's going to <laughs> seek out one of these as well There's some i remember seek reading yeah because I, I i read everything you know regard if it was a comic i read it if it was in my sister's comics or or not it didn't matter i read everything the next one for me has to be when pat mills and joe Cahoon released one of the finest british comics ever uh charlie's war uh, originally in Battle Picture Weekly, um, it was 79 to 86. But I actually came across it when they uh, they they reprinted in Eagle when that was revamped. Yeah. So late 80s, and then the Judge Dredd magazine I think did some as well. So that's how I came across it. Mm-hmm. Um, Mills gives a really stark portrayal of the working class, um, uh, especially the, the lead character Charlie Bourne, um, enlisting at the start of the war having lied about his age. And it's just the quintessential First World War Tommy story. Um, and what I loved about it was that you saw the transformation um, through the war from, like, the last... Ca- he witnesses the last cavalry charge. Cool. Which is followed by the horrors of mustard gas and trench warfare and the birth of mechanised warfare with a Mark I tank. Um, and he plays heavily on class warfare throughout it as well. Um, also deals with conscientious objectors and deserters and, and mutineers, and it's very much a social history, mm. um, as much as it is a military history. Um, so he you, you goes from like Verdun to Passchendaele, and the I think it ends in the Russian Civil War. Um, but it's just meticulously researched in every aspect, and out, outside the genre, you know, just ignoring the genre, the storytelling, the artwork is just gold standard. It really is. Um, it's just a masterpiece of writing from Mills. It really is. Um, at the same time, I remember Marvel did. Um, it was in my local comic shop. They, uh, they did the Nam comic, um, and I, I picked up the odd copy. Um, what I didn't realise until years later was it was actually kind of released in real time. So what I didn't realise was you were kind of following characters and they just disappear. But then what they were doing was they were doing it day by day. Though that character finished his tour of duty, he gets rotated back, and then he'll come back. Right. And it was, it was obviously well it. researched, and mm. uh, it was over time when I should imagine an awful lot of people involved probably were conscripted over. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was one that always stood out. But like like wars and like wars themselves, we, we're never going to run out of war comics either. Um, episode thirty four. I gave a breakdown of the best of modern war comics, uh, and I discussed the incredibly realistic Black Powder Red Earth series from John Chang and Kane Smith and Josh Taylor, which is the the world of actual private military contractors. It's a really fascinating world about how you can actually go out and get paid to basically do some quite dodgy stuff all over Mm. the world, and it's it's a strange... It's, it's, it's kind of a strange shadowy world, really, when you've got like, I mean, there's real contractor companies like, is it Blackwater and all those kind of, yes. that do 
you know the private security and and, and stuff. But um, and I also uh, got to make a nod to Nathan Edmondson and Mitch Gerrard's The Activity, which is kind of life inside the special operations team that work for the uh, ISA. Um, yeah, so that, that's if you're interested in the truly ultra modern arena, I'd go back and check that episode. And that's it. I'm ready for the penalty uh, shootout Uh-oh. on this one. <laughs> I can't remember if I've written these or not. Hang on. Okay. <laughs> I've got two out of three, but we'll we'll be all right. <laughs> There's five, mate. I know. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, Xenozoic Tales by Mark Schultz, um, pulpy mix of all sci-fi, gorgeously reflective of all the genre has to <laughs> represent. <laughs> uh, I will go for BPRE, um, Black Powder Red Earth. Uh, ultra realistic view of modern PMCs operating in the Middle East theatre that separates your JSOCs from your SIGINTs and your DAV grooves. You've got to be really into the lingo to know what any of that means. Um, I will actually vote for Cadillacs and Dinosaurs. It's pretty cool. Okay, it's for me. I'll vote for that one then. It's, it, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a great example of that. Every time we do these, there are so many that fit into so many different genres. It's it's quite strange, you know, when it, it kind of bends. You know, much like the next one, Strange Science Fantasy. It's got so many different kinds of stories. At their heart, science might be a recurring theme, but it's not the main particular reason for it. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, Ultimately, strange science fantasy is, um, I suppose, a collision of a collision of so many different kinds of stories, gorgeously told with strange science at the heart of it. I do fancy reading up on these. <laughs> absolutely, I have to say. You looked it up, didn't you, while I was talking about? I, I, I did actually. Yeah. It's absolutely gorgeous. It, it. I mean, oh, he's done so many, so many good stories but i mean there's something about that one i think it really comes from the heart i think paul pope might have done some stuff in it as well actually. well you might have a winner here because i think i've got a throw away here because i've persuaded myself out of it almost it's a superb comic but um or rather it appeared in 2008 uh bad company oh yeah uh, an unknown war-torn world and an unknown universe in the future uses this simple premise as a vehicle to explore the psychological horror and absence of humanity in war. It's sci-fi. <laughs> I, was, I was trying to keep everything else I've kept to absolute war and try to keep it... Um, I suppose I should have come out with a definition first. It has to be based on real-life war, I think. Bad Company was on my mind because I started reading it by accident when I was researching this, Bad Company came up and I thought, I love Bad Company, so I started reading it. <laughs> and that's why I made it, but it's not, it's sci-fi, so that's definitely a win for you. Yes, actually, yeah, that should be a... Uh, Apologies, be I should have swapped that one out. <laughs> <laughs> should be part of the rule, yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, Rassel by uh, Jeff Smith. Um, I mean... It's a strangely energetic, uh, totally atmospheric. A lot of it is told through, uh, is told wordlessly, which is um, a standout achievement for a book like this. But it's, um, yeah, strangely hypnotic. I've put. I think I might win your vote on this one. It depends on whether you've read it. <laughs> Last Day in Vietnam. Is that the Eisner? 
part anecdotal, part autobiography. Yeah. Will Eisner's anthology covers the tragedy, the sublime, the gallows humour and the pathos of war. Yeah. It's fab. It really is. And um, it's it's one of the few more sort of true sort of autobiographical stories he did, really. Because he had a, quite a connection with the army for a long period of his of his career. More than I realised, actually. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I... I, I I think your your documentation of his entire life helped a lot, <laughs> but I didn't realise just how much he kept going back to do things with the army. Yeah, and... yeah well, I mean, it was, I think, I think he was responsible and, and still, you know, involved in the the maintenance magazines that he, he did for the company for, for a good while after I, I thought, you know. There's, there's was... actually a write-up about that, actually, on the... Um, uh, the start of last day in Vietnam. It explains about him doing the technical yeah. manuals and stuff. Did, um, did you come across the the machine gun manual that he drew? No, no. In your research? No, I haven't actually seen it. Oh, I loved, I'm pretty sure I found it online when I was doing my Eisner profile. But yeah, this it was, and it was given to like every person in Vietnam was basically this comic that he drew about how to look after your weapon and but but, but he used to I mean he was involved in like the research and talking to like he used to talk to grunts to find out yeah. what problems were you having with that jeep what problems are you having with this that or the other yeah totally um, and, and that he knew how to use you know yeah graphic language to to deliver that information which is now if you think about story. it a lot of the manuals that you do get now the to avoid translation, it has some sort of pictogram at the beginning of most of them, you know, whether yeah. it's, you know, how to use it. This is an aside here, and I realise it's an aside, but as much as you get frustrated with IKEA instructions, once you get them, they are absolutely superb. The <laughs> yeah. tiny littlest detail allows you to understand if you've got that particular right piece of wood upside down or not, because they've shaded in that area, which shows you that it's that side. It's they are, I have to admit, as much as I get frustrated, um, in our first house, we bought quite a bit of IKEA stuff, but I had to sit down and just say, no, it's me that's wrong. <laughs> the diagram <laughs> is right. And I hated myself for that. Anyway. So, uh, Okay, uh, next one. Hang on, we haven't voted. You, was that a vote for you? Oh, for... I said vote for Eisner, definitely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, awesome. If you figured out I'm putting in cheaty ones, I know that you can't not oh, vote for. It's funny, isn't it? Yeah, we know each other so well. <laughs> there are certain key words you can say. Well, this, this is another one. Like, okay, New Gods, Kirby. You can't imagine comics without Kirby, and especially science fiction. This is the king doing science fiction comics yeah uh the next one i had was commando for action and adventure uh going up to 59 years and the quintessential war comic and still giving um yeah i'm torn on this one because i know there's something about Commando's... commando that is just admirable for for what it is but i'm thinking of voting not for the title new gods for Kirby. Yeah, but you're representing. It'd be so that's why against... I'm tied oh, here. Yeah, I don't know if I can vote against Dundee. Tom would never forgive us. <laughs> 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 we can take the fucking. Uh... I think I think I might have to vote for Commando on that one, even over Kirby, because I don't know. So that's a draw. Yeah. I think I'm going for Kirby, you see. So okay. we've actually voted for each other's. No, I just... Draw, though. I, there's just something about this little comic, you know, 5,326 episodes. Still going in the world we're in. Still in your local Smiths. I, I just know. find it... I just find it quite incredible. It's fine. It's, we're on 2-1 two, for... 2 to science fiction, 1 to war, 1 draw. And I've got the last one, so I'm, I'm confident. American flag, groundbreaking, industry-changing tome that shows what comics can really do. I went for, for Charlie's War, um, Tour de Force from Mills and mm -hmm. Cahoon, um, metac meticulously researched military yeah, yeah. social history. It's a tough one. 
it is a tough one that I'm not sure either well even if we stick to our guns it's not going to affect the result really so is it not hang on no because I'm not going to vote, vote even though no. I'm not going to vote for yours. So even if you vote for my uncle, I want if you to... vote for your own, I've won. So quite frankly. Oh, OK. Well, that's that settled. <laughs> then. Okay. Oh, so, it's, so it's a draw on Charlie's War versus yes. flag as well. You can have okay. two draws and the American flag still stands victory. Oh, yeah. I was right. OK. I wasn't understanding my own symbols there. Yeah. That means that you've got two wins. Okay. Sci-fi beats war. Sci-fi beats war, and I'll make a note of it this time because we keep keep losing yeah. the results. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it down on this side as well. Sci-fi. Okay. So. Right. Adult. I'm gonna be a little bit briefer because my notes are appalling. But what makes a, a comic an adult comic? I mean, in, in today's sort of world, it's language, violence, sex, uh, the level of, of each of those things. Uh, also, the, I think the actual content can, even if it's acceptable for a child to read it, it can put a book in an adult camp. So something that's quite politically minded. No, I yeah, I agree with that definition. Technically minded. Yeah. I once read, I think it's called Logic Comics. It's about Bertrand Russell's uh sort of I say I've read it, I still can't remember what it's about, but it was a burden of proof, is it, in sort of like science, I think, or equations. I was interested, uh, but felt like a child after I'd read it. <laughs> it was definitely <laughs> one of the most adult books I'd ever read. But um when comics started, uh, they they came from comic strips. Comic strips were seen to be every seemed to be for everybody. There was certainly a family thing that would be passed around. The same comic strips could be read at the time by uh, most people in the family. Uh, but when comic books sprang forth, they were quickly put into the domain of children. Uh, so the very first more funnies uh, were, I think, directly aimed at children. Now, I don't know if that was kind of what doomed comic books to have the relationship with the age of the reader that it's remained with and to a certain extent constantly fights against. As early as... You know, the late 30s, early 40s, uh, you had parents worrying about the content that their children were reading based on really the assumption that nobody else would be reading them except their kids. Mm. So uh, it's something that comics have had to deal with um, and perhaps been a shade scared of, of actually doing um the 40s like you say is largely a period of the level of content being aimed against mostly at uh children um you're talking i mean the crime comics in the in the 40s that that came about weren't of a level that they soon turned into in the 50s so the first whiff of comics attempting to talk to um i think a readership above the level they had previously it was maybe driven by uh, the gis that were reading them uh, abroad and carrying on reading when they came back i think that was why we had a shift away from superheroes into crime and horror and science fiction yeah EC, as we keep pointing out, with the driving force behind, you know, elevating genre stories. Uh, the price of that success was for them to be eviscerated by the comics code and stabbed in the back by the rest of the comic companies, really. Yeah. But interestingly, they then 
uh, Gaines then turned his attention to a change in format, became a magazine, and once again, magazines are for adults. It that seems to be the you know once you've switched away from being a comic and you start Mad Magazine, oh fine, you can talk to everybody again. You've kind of jumped out of the ghetto. So comics uh, stayed in that same sort of self-enforced uh, place with the comics code in place until uh, the 60s when Marvel first gained the attention of students. That was supposedly the driving force. Once Stan found out that, you know, he had this attention from a different, slightly older group, they were still acceptable to be read by any age really but some of the concepts became perhaps hidden or introduced into stories that could have um, an extra level of um, attraction to slightly older readership uh 70s exp- i mean i'm skipping over some things like the underground which obviously has their own uh level of adult uh, readership in terms of the begins of direct market essentially came about through head shops and early 70s you got fantagraphics and other much more adult inclined books coming out even got to the attention of um stan lee and marvel tried their own underground comic with um uh, dennis kitchen uh, which I've seen, I think it's comics with an X or something like that. It's a strange little experiment that Marvel were, were trying to to get into. 70s saw Marvel get into magazines with some of the black and white stuff, but looking back at it now, I don't think the content necessarily was uh, was more adult oriented. They did uh, knock the comics code on the head to do a couple of issues of Spider Man. Uh, where the drug issues were raised, but then they went back to producing what they did uh, previously. It really took um, the 80s for, you know, what would be termed mature reader books to become uh, more something that comic books were prepared to, to, to tackle. It seems the British invasion was one of the main sort of driving forces of this when we did have Alan Moore, Jamie Delano, uh, Neil Gaiman and uh, Grant Morrison putting that, you know, what at the time grim and gritty twist, uh, Vertigo and, you know, Dark Horse and other creator owned companies were able to pick up on on this. I mean, first comics, Comico, some of those direct markets titles had much more of an edge to them. Um, it was probably still violence that led the way in terms of what what made them adult. American comics didn't tend to use the language that British writers could turn to. Yes. Think, <laughs> so, uh, you, uh, a British writer will make something filthier oh, yes. only than I think it, than an American writer tends to. It's a national trait. <laughs> but you know, sex probably the least of of the things that would would uh, you know uh, be be turned to by publishers. A penthouse did do a series of comics. I remember in, I think it was the early 90s, and they had some pretty big names involved. Uh, obviously, heavy metal on the international front. I did not not so familiar. Um, Epic. Were they trying to be heavy metal? The magazine format didn't seem to be used necessarily by Marvel in the same way with Epic Illustrated. You know, the format was being used great, and you did have the odd boob. Um, if I'm remembering rightly, maybe the odd bit of violence, but again, it didn't seem, and there were some stories that did have that, uh, content that we talked about. But post Vertigo, you, you have now some more companies that can be a little more specific 
in terms of that's what they do. Uh, Avatar seems to have quite, you know, uh, a horror market where they can turn up the dial a little bit more, but also more smaller boutique publishing. Um, like Jim Balent, do you remember he used to draw Catwoman? Yeah. He set up Broadsword Comics in the 99, I think it was, and he's been publishing a book called Tarot since then. And that seems very titillating, big boobed sort of, you know, market in, in, in adult terms. So the fact that he's, if he's been able to do it for that long, there's obviously an ability to do it in, in the market involved, you know. Um, so where else? And now to the point where these you know, markets, I think the direct market allows the gatekeepers to be the comic shop themselves so that you actually have not the worry of people picking them up in Smith's, but you can have a gatekeeper asking, are you old enough to buy this? There's a there's a level of protection in the industry. Um, can I say the first example I ever saw of that was yeah. always at uni and um Deadline and crisis. Mm. Every news agents, they they were on the top shelf, which is really annoying. Really yeah, annoying. <laughs> I remember um, picking up yeah. Deadline from yeah the top shelf in Smiths. It was that that first cover, you know, blew me away. I loved yeah. that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think you know, it's. Uh, uh, and I tend to now think of adults. Back then, it was sex and violence. But now, when I came to write down a list of the adult books that I would recommend, the fact that you could show, you know, an act of extreme uh, violence or sexual gratification isn't really something that drives a recommendation no that's the big problem i have with this genre yeah it's the content it's you know it's having somebody discussing an issue or even having a comic that allows a subject to be explored in the correct way yeah really and much like all these other genres it can be any genre but at the heart of it it is don't treat your audience as an infant yeah. Um, something that Howard Shakin talks about a lot and I think his book um, Hey Kids Comics which is a, a sort of three volume uh, exploration of the comic book industry he talks about how the second arc is about uh, how the industry infantilized itself essentially and, and cut off access to two different readers to prove there were and the times that they have tried it i mean really that the 80s as it kind of undermined itself this grim and grittiness to the point where writers themselves started to take the mickey out of the approach that that uh was to a character i remember there's an issue of planetary where warren ellis sort of undercuts the whole grim and gritty approach to comics by having a, a superhero sort of bemoan why he used to have a normal life, but now has become, you know, uh, every possible affectation of, you know, that he's he's gay or adopted or, you know, trans or, you know, yeah. all of these things that would be explored, not because it was a driving part of the story, but the writers felt that this was the way they could add an element of that to what was still a, uh, perhaps you know less interesting concept Mm. so uh ones that i would put forward i mean um the spirit is one of the oldest yet still uh oh thank you there you go mike i've got a delivery (laughs) well while i'm getting curry cooked i can smell (laughs) so uh it's got a competition now (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh so yeah uh what 
yeah, the spirit. I mean, the spirit was early 40s. Mm. And it's adult in terms of every story works to the absolute, absolute best that the story at its height. I mean, obviously, there's more people involved than you tend to think, obviously, when Eisen went away. But there's some spirit stories that are just absolutely beautiful in their brevity and in the story sense, in the style and atmosphere that bring that is is brought to it. Um, some of the vertigo stuff, um, I think, that stands the test of time. Certainly, Swamp Thing, which was perhaps one of the driving forces behind Vertigo becoming Vertigo, because it, you know, it was doing those stories before Vertigo existed, didn't you know, wasn't it? Um, is it the uh, American Gothic storyline that yeah. Al was doing? Um, the Hellblazer and and Sandman. Sandman, um, yeah, I was going to say you have to mention Sandman. Sandman is, I think, uh, one of those books, and again, it really helps that it finished, that becomes just a great example of what you can do in a comic. You know, it was um, poetic and mythic. Um, it explored all aspects of um, of the story potential involved, regardless of the universe that it occasionally visited. So yeah. there were just very, very good stories that happened to have a character who used to be a superhero or even still was a superhero the connection like we were talking about the Eternals and their connection to Kirby Sandman managed to have that connection to the DC universe and it not affect the series detrimentally in fact you know sometimes um, the, the strands made it stronger somewhat um, where else I mean, Sunstone was one that you mentioned, which yes. I wasn't aware. Of. So I did look up Sunstone, and I did. I was very, very intrigued by it. It's absolutely gorgeous in in terms of the art, and it's incredibly. I was I was absolutely amazed at how a book like that. So, yeah, I should have mentioned. Um, so it's by Stefan. Is it Sajik? I was hoping you'd pronounce it first, actually. <laughs> this guy's just done Harleen. I think Sajik or something. But... Yeah, he's done Harleen <laughs> for, for DC Comics. But he writes and, and draws it. And it's, it's essentially the story between um, two women who become uh, attracted to each other and become involved in a, a BDSM relationship. And he's very much a part of that scene, I think, in his personal life. It's it's an important part of his personal life. So exploring it in a comic, um, immediately you tend to think of perhaps some of the more uh, uh, graphic images that you've seen when that, you know, and in superhero comics, it's a kind of, you know, normal part of some supervillain designs in yes, know, that yeah. kind of fashion. But if, um, if anything, it's, it's much more about the relationship between them. Mm. And, you know, it's much more about, uh, not, not safety, but um, I suppose trust or delivering something that they 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 spend. I was amazed how many pages were spent on the same conversation without you realizing necessarily that you were you were still involved in the same conversation. Yes, it it kind of gives me a bit of a, a warm fuzzy feeling, a bit like Love and Rockets does, mm. in that you can be. So engrossed when nothing is happening. And yeah. when actual BDSM sex scenes are taking place, you're not actually concentrating or even realizing that it's, it's the actual conversation they're having that kind of just draws you in. It's, it's very strange, but 
I, I, yeah, I thought you, you, you'd appreciate it at least on some level sort of thing. Um, I came across it by accident. It was part of a, a, a humble bundle. Right. Uh, and then on a, uh, probably a couple of Valentine's days ago, um, they kind of did like the first four volumes. So, uh, I've carried on collecting them digitally since. Mm. Um, and it is, it's, again, it's, it's, it's a bit of an outlier, I think. It's truly adult. Um, if you, I did a bit of research for it because I was going, I think I mentioned it maybe on, I did an episode about International Women's Day. Right. Um, but when it's discussed in forums, all you hear, um, from people who are actually into BDSM, um, all they do is say, this is the only way, uh, the only true portrayal of it I've ever seen in any format, film, mm. books, any kind of media. Uh, and that's because, as you said, the, the artist and his wife, it's part of their relationship. Uh, and I should say his wife is a fantastic artist as well. Mm. She does her own stuff as well. Um, they are, it, it just seems like a fantastic double team, if you know what I mean, yeah. of comic book artists. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, so it's kind of you learn something, but you're kind of just – swept away with it and a lot of the time like i said i I do feel nothing is happening other than it's just a relationship that you're seeing evolving and that's it Mm. and to capture your attention for that long in a comic book i think takes a bit Mm. um no it's it's it it is it's very impressive um i mean i've got to mention uh, howard shaking again i know it's a bit of (laughs) banging on but uh, pretty much everything he's done is is adult and not in terms of again it's not about violence or sex or language it's just dealing with an issue and having a story that you're going to be involved in be more than the fact that you know uh, someone stole something or trying to get something back it's about the negotiation or it's it's about the um relationships involved all the politics you know a lot of the uh, stuff that he deals with it might be sexual politics or it might be the you know international everything has got uh you know a real sophisticated sharpness to it i mean so i mean i put down black kiss as an example purely because um, I think that was a reaction in the 90s to the mature readers label that had appeared in the in the mid I suppose yes it, it came sort of mid late 80s I think didn't it with with Vertigo and, and mature readers and that was his reaction because I think that was him basically saying you know you're just putting a label on something and adding elements to an existing product you're not doing a product that is part and parcel and wholly adult so he does have uh in in black kiss it does start it's you know it's largely perhaps um a a crime drama but i think he deliberately just ratchets everything up to show what you know what a, a, a an OTT EC era version of an adult comic can be. Yeah. I think he he was doing it, you know, quite a bit like, um, well, Frank Miller with Sin City. He was deliberately ratcheting that up to sort of pulp levels. Um, so we mentioned Sandman, uh, Cerebus, I know is something that has suffered because of the reactions to the artist uh, uh and perhaps what he'd done previously um actually mike's eight o'clock oh we can give a short online <laughs> <laughs> i wondered what that noise was i can't hear oscar uh, just to explain it's eight o'clock <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking for international <laughs> listeners. We're giving a clap for our 
Nothing yeah. else. NHS, key workers. We got the, the family <laughs> over the way are out with their kids as well. Yeah. I did think this week that we might um we might put Daisy with a keyboard out by the front door because I know lots of people that <laughs> play musical instruments, they've been doing that as well. Okay. It's quite nice that we've been caught doing it. Uh, I can't see out to uh, the, to the front of ours. We've got some neighbours out the front sort of thing, which we can normally see, but uh, they're probably wondering about my absence again then, because um, yeah. <laughs> Alison's yeah. cooking, so I'm not sure what she was able to oh, get. Out. We did miss, we missed the first one for the same reason. It was eight o'clock, like in our house. We we had, I think we were some. I was in the kitchen. No one was cooking. Fryers on. And, you know, I think we, we, we didn't even hear the, the street clapping. But, yeah, uh, Cerebus, he's got a rocky relationship with, uh, I think, perhaps comic readers. I know Dave Sim later in uh, the series. He did 300 issues of, he wrote and drew 300 issues of the same comic. It's an incredible achievement. It doesn't perhaps stay of the same standard. But early doors... Uh, High society is a properly adult, funny book. Mm. It's got, you know, it introduced me to Groucho Marx. The humour that is driven by, uh, a, a, you know, a, a crazy monarch, essentially, keeping control on his staff by building a ridiculously complicated bureaucracy is is at the heart of it and he goes on to make he goes on to explore i suppose similar roles and relationships uh and you know cerebus i don't think it's a spoiler he becomes pope you know from from the you know from the first 50 issues of him being a conan parody then becoming um a yeah i suppose does it become mayor i think in the high society and then following that trajectory of power upwards it's you know i i can't remember when i i have got all of the books i have read every issues it definitely goes off off the rails and you know it well it's, it's actually coined a term hasn't it in comics mythology which is cerebus syndrome Mm. which you can accuse certain writers of. And that's where you start a story with a simple premise and then you suddenly expand and expand and expand it into such a complex story with a cast of thousands yeah. that's not resembling its origins in any way, shape or form. Yes. Um, and, I've, and I've used that term a few times, actually, when, when talking about certain writers. Yeah. No, it, it is interesting how it does change uh, but it still continued to introduce uh, and i suppose this is again what makes it uh adult it still manages to introduce concepts information the fact that he would spotlight different uh real life um people in the story so hemingway or um oscar wilde um they they both become story they be, both become characters in Cerebus's story and in the back matter which was sometimes you know the best bit of Cerebus you are continually being educated um or introduced to concepts and and, and interesting parts of you know uh of life through this this comic book story um and lastly uh the uh, the adult book that is the latest adult book i suppose that i've discovered which again is adult in in it in the most unique way uh is atomic hercules it is you know it's it's one of these new bright stars uh that has introduced uh, a character and a style of book which is um you know stellar in, in terms of this particular genre um it's uh it's from tony esmond and adam falp and it's it's been kicks oh, it's on kickstarter now isn't it i think kickstarter mm. it, it's a very short run though this time i noticed i think they've only done 16 instead of 30 days 
So do jump on as soon as you hear this. But it's issue two out now. Uh, issue one was out, I think, earlier in the year. I'm sure you can pick up both as part of the Kickstarter. But it is a, a love letter to 70s uh, Bronze Age comics with uh, a unique uh, feel to it in terms of you know the audience that it's it's aiming for. Um, it's it's absolutely brilliant. I love it. I've not read this, but I, it looks like it's got quite a, a sick sense of humour to it. <laughs> Is, would that be fair to say? Yeah, and it, it's little bits of yes, it's 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 very graphic. Just as I was saying, really, in terms of it is absolutely, I think what we were just t- talking about in terms of um, not worrying about what makes a comic adult except the excessive elements. I mean, it really is kind of the exception that proves the rule in in terms of it being excessively violent and sweary and, um, yeah, not really sexy. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, it's just got, it's just got some real passion behind it. And, you know, the fun just really does come through it's just it's just uh, fab you know it it really does so uh yeah that's um that's just some good adult books to um to look out for really i'm not i'm not suggesting they're the best i'm not suggesting they're the epitome of the uh, genre and i do realize there are huge gaps in terms of european comics and japanese comics and yeah. the adult comics that you know don't contain any of those other elements but you know get in touch and tell me what i uh i should be reading i don't know you see this this is just bad luck for me really because um you you drew the adult genre uh, and this would have been my first and probably only legitimate chance to do an entire episode about hentai which I have threatened Ian with since the beginning of the podcast. <laughs> it's not anything I know about, but I just think it would be so funny. <laughs> <to do this. laughs> um, uh, and if you don't know what that is, look it up. Uh, <laughs> um, I was also going to say Humanoids, actually, uh, as a publisher. They do yeah. a lot of the um, translated French stuff. Um, and again, it's, it, most of it harks back to, to heavy metal that you mentioned. Um, so you've got people like like Mobius, um, uh, an artist like uh, uh, Milo Manara, who Milo Manara is more blatant, whereas Mobius, I, I always find his stuff more story first, titillation added in. Yeah. Whereas Milo Manaro <laughs> is titillation with story added in. If you're lucky. <laughs> um, yeah. But there is some interesting stuff actually from from him um, when he does more more serious stuff that doesn't come under the erotica label, should we say? But um, yeah, it was a difficult genre, I think, to get right. But yeah, yeah it was uh, a good call because I think adult to me nowadays does probably mean more general content being for the more adult or mature person rather than oh, it's got this this or this thing. But yeah. Well, yeah, erotic is a kind of a, a subsection of adult, isn't it? Yeah. Really? And and you know there are other people like, um, uh, you know, um, Shailin Cowboy, uh, Jeff Darrow, and Jeff Darrow, you know, with hard boiled and yeah, you've got all that almost slow motion violence. It looks like. Um, it really is a kind of uh, examination of, you know, violence at a kind yeah. of microscopic level when it's it's done that way. But that, people again, takes it... People won't be able to see me wincing when I'm remembering bits, but yeah. Yeah, it, but <laughs> it, it, it takes the, the actual element in action in a slightly different direction just by doing yeah. it in that incredibly detailed way. It, it's, it suddenly becomes 
uh, an examination of it in a, in a quite a different way, certainly than watching it in a, in a movie sometimes. So, fantasy. Right. Um, <clears throat> this is just a huge genre. So, uh, in order to make it manageable, I've kind of gone down to more of what I truly believe fantasy is. And that is stories that are derived or inspired by folklore and myths of the world. It's magical or supernatural or occult in some way. Um, and I don't particularly believe that a period or setting is required. It doesn't have to be medieval or, or sword and sandal type era. Um, but it cuts down a lot, I think, because if you look at, how I've looked at all the different histories of all the genres I've done so far and trying to trace it back to the 30s and 40s. The description fantasy really refers to anything that's fantastical in nature mm. and is mostly applied when the story is actually just what we'd see nowadays as straight science fiction mm. rather than historical fantasy sort of. Yeah. So that's why I've gone with the folklore and myth kind of angle on this. Um, and it was popular back then. I mean, you had books like Weird Tales, which was a collection of stories, not comic, but written stories. And you got Robert E. Howard actually, you know, um, doing Call of Atlantis in there. And so fantasy in that kind of definition I've given it did exist back then and the 30s and 40s even. Um, but it just wasn't in comic form, particularly. Um, and Cult of Atlantis. Um, I don't, have you ever, did you ever read any Cult of Atlantis? I did have some of the kind of um, Howard sort of anthologies that collected some of the books. I didn't read a Cult book by itself, but I did have books that had Brack MacMorn and um, some of the other smaller characters, you know, that... Uh, I- I think it's one think of these it's a things. Howard that, Reader, I think it was called, or something. All, all of them grew, I think, far more um, in the comic form than they did the the literary form. To be honest, um, after after he committed suicide, I think the comic world of his creations are far better than um, than where he took them to in his lifetime. Um, Cole, for me, is he is just Conan with a bit more brains uh, <laughs> and uh, less interest in rumpy pumpy to be honest um <laughs> it is sort and sorcery but yeah um the 30s and 40s again had slim pickings um for this brand of fantasy maybe small stories that were in some of the anthologies at the time um one notable exception actually was the american newspaper strip prince valiant um by harold foster um which started in 37 which is, funnily enough, the same year that Tolkien released um, The Hobbit. Um, the only reason I know personally about Prince Valiant was that um, it's kind of an Arthurian legend romp, is the yeah. best way to describe it. But my old school library had a hardback reprint of these stories. Um, and it was really dog eared, and he uh, was neither the start or an end of a story. So it was probably volume four or something like that. I don't know. Um, but it was just the artwork was absolutely stunning and really realistic. Um, it's the artwork you think you, you look at and you think the inking was, was amazing. But to get that realism from it, it looks like they had to have had a muse or a model. Mm-hmm. But what they're depicting, I don't understand how they did that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was yeah um really stunning artwork on that um in the early 50s c.s lewis published like the lion the witch and the wardrobe and that started popularizing fantasy across a, a much wider audience i think and lord of the rings followed in in 54 um until then the the core fantasy works of writers like uh, edgar rice burroughs robert E. Howard, Fritz Lieber, um, they were popular, um, it, but they had a small but fervent literary following. Um, but those works now got sort of re-examined in the wake of Lord of the Rings. Uh, and that was what really kind of started a literary fantasy boom. And that's where you had all the new writers like Ursula Le Guin, um, Susan Cooper, Anne McCaffrey, Stephen Donaldson. 
my hero, Michael Moorcock, uh, Richard Adams, and yes, Watership Down does count as fantasy. It's very <laughs> mythological if you read the book. Uh, and your Terry Brooks's and your Piers Anthony's. But, um, and I think that's when the genre, genre really got shaped, I think. Uh, and comics finally caught up, really. I'd say, and I know this is going to be a very disagreeable point, but October 1970, Marvel published Conan the Barbarian, which for me is the quintessential fantasy book. Hmm. Um, they followed that up quickly with Savage Tales a year later and then Savage Sword of Conan, I think, was was 74. Um, do you want to learn more? Then check out podcast episode 45, <laughs> where I did the entire Conan A to Z. Um, so I get to cut this short now. Uh, and now we're on a roll, because that opened up a way to Red Sonia, which is going to be a forthcoming episode from me. Nice. No, the outline on that one uh, and Solomon Kane um, as the genre grew it got its own parody comic in the form of Cerebus the Aardvark which we've mentioned <laughs> already um, France had a Metal Herlant magazine which dedicated itself to the best of sci-fi and fantasy um, with some of the best artists uh, and that got picked up and translated by U.S. publishers a few years later as Heavy Metal Magazine, which we've also talked about. Uh, and I I actually made a note here. I can't list the number of podcast episodes I've, I've covered, how important Heavy Metal Magazine is. And we've done it already this episode. Um, DC Comics kind of caught up, I think, with The Warlord. Um, that's Pilot Travis Horgan trapped in the what I'd describe as a hollow earth lost world kind mm. of fantasy setting with, you know, heavy fantasy elements and dinosaurs. Um, um, and this was an offshoot from, from weird world comic. But um, I think this really was the start of them getting into gear. Really um, in the eighties came Arax and a thunder, which was probably the most direct response to the popularity of Conan. And they went kind of a heavy Nordic mythology way. Lots of Vikings. Um, Aryan Lord of Atlantis was a, was another one I remember at the time. Um, in the 80s and 90s was the golden age of Dungeons and Dragons in comics. Uh, with your Forgotten Realms, your Spelljammer and your Dragonlance offshoots. Um, but hey, you can learn more about that in my complete history of D&D. <laughs> uh, in episodes 53... 54 and 55. <laughs> I went a bit overboard on that one. We'll go into that. <laughs> uh, in 83, 2000 AD gave us Slain. Need I say more? Well, you can just check out episode 11 um, <laughs> for my uh, for my Slain special, which also explains why it's pronounced Slania. It's Celtic. Uh, uh, and it's at this point, I think, that the comic genre just explodes to the point where there is just too much to go into mm. because the fantasy genre gets picked up. I'd call Sandman fantasy. Vertigo did a yeah. lot of stuff, but Sandman for me is it's adult and it's fantasy. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of mythology. Um, in fact, there's a lot of mixed mythology in there um, and it's a fantastical story. So. Modern day stuff. There's just too many to list. You've got um, the divine and the, the, and the wicked. Although some people initially thought that was a, a, a sort of like a, a harder hitting superhero. No, it wasn't at all. It's pure fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess really it comes down to what I'm going to put forward for the penalty shootout as my absolute pick. And every single one of them bar one, I'm going to refer the audience <laughs> to an episode. Cool. Okay, well, let's get to it. I've got to move my empties. My empties are piling up on the desk. <laughs> I almost dropped the bottle open before I made a big clash. Um, okay, it's your turn to go first. Okay. <clears throat> I'll start off with my number five is Mouse Guard. In an alternative medieval society with no humans, it's up to the brave mice of the Mouse Guard to defend the territories in David Peterson's strangely gritty anthropomorphic world. 
and that's a forthcoming episode. <laughs> oh, but that's the one. Uh, I've got Sunstone, which uh, is glorious artwork with a caring, believing, believable relationship at its heart. But it is a bit talky. So I'm going to ask <laughs> Okay, that, that stops me having a dilemma on that one, actually. I do love Sunstone. It does save it, yeah. No, it's 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 really it is very very good. I did find I I had to read it in short chunks. I I really enjoyed it, and yeah. it's a great great uh, example of how to make conversations interesting. So yes. from a from a very technical point of view, for me as somebody you know looking at um, a comic page, looking how what you can do to actually turn a conversation into something that is, you know, totally absorbing. Okay. My number four is Monstrous, the Eisner winning high fantasy epic from Marjorie Liu and Sana Takada is complex, challenging and oozes imagination and originality. Want to know more? Check out episode 24, (laughs) where I do an entire Mike's mutterings on Monstrous. Um, I've got Cerebus High Society, a funny animal book that's very funny, but is definitely not for kids. Oh, that's another difficult one for me, because I am fond. See, I haven't read Monstrous. I know it's, Mm. it's it's on my list. So I can't, I can't vote for monstrous. I I'll go for Cerebus on that one actually. I do need to read that. It's an oldie, and a, I've got a fondness for it. Monstrous is definitely recommended though, mate. Seriously. Complex though. I'd, I'd almost put it in the adult camp when it comes to. I had to, I had to flick back. It's like, yeah. I've lost the plot here. <laughs> it's like, was I a bit tired whilst I was reading? I don't know. But yeah, it's, it's quite complex, quite yeah. quick. Yeah. I mean, it, it it just goes to show, really. I mean, the, the genre battle, we, we could redo this whole World Cup and just put different comics in different, you know, uh, in different battles. Yes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Star. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're a glass collector as well Come yeah I've got on. waitress service here Mike Look. <laughs> my number three is Rat Queens fantasy oh, yeah. with the most unprofessional filthiest drug addled adventurer party to ever hit the tavern want to know more? Well, check out episode 55 the third part of my Dungeons and Dragons in comics series to find out all about Rat Queens uh, I got Black Kiss, excessive and sarcastic take on what adult comics could be. I'd argue that Rat Queens also satisfies both categories here. It's quite adult. Yeah, <laughs> it is actually. I, I did enjoy uh, Rat Queens, and. Um, I feel I've been banging on about how it's shaking too much this episode. So I'll give it a <laughs> Change the record, Pete. <laughs> okay, big hitters now. My number two is Slania, aka Slain. Supported by the best writers and artists in the business, the Celtic mythology saga of Slania was. The jewel in 2000 AD's crown. Oof. I've got Atomic Hercules, the essence of Bronze Age comics mixed with the best elements of those gloriously dodgy films that made trips to the video shop so exciting. Kill Raven meets Flesh Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm torn here because I've not read it, but I really want to. I've heard such good things about it. Yeah, I. Well, I mean, funnily enough, it's kind of in in both camps, and they're both they're kind of similar in a sense of them both being, you know, 
fantasy because uh, you know Slanya has got that kind of excess to it as well. So I think we'd be all right with calling that one a draw, to be honest. A draw. Because I do now, think there's there's very definite the well there's a definite connection sort of thing there. Yeah. And in fact, you know, um, it'd be great to see those two face off. <laughs> My number one is Conan. (laughs) This is my dirty play, by the way. (laughs) The hard-hitting Hyborian is the epitome of fantasy genre and his new lease of life under Marvel is faring well. I'll refer you back to my episode 45. This This is actually quite fitting because... I, I almost thought you would go with what my last choice is. But this is so good because there's only one result from this competition. We we already we are well, there's only one result from this particular penalty shootout that we we're in now, the fifth one. We already know that Conan's won. I mean we already know. <laughs> but what's so funny and exciting is how people might react when they find out what what my fifth choice is that I'm immediately throwing under the bus. Because I've got sand, I've got the Sandman. <laughs> oh, oh, oh no. i got the Sandman. Mythic, That's powerful, gonna be full. <laughs> mythic, powerful stories that feel more like a collection of modern legends. But, you know, much as I adore Sandman and Neil Gaiman and all of the incredible artists that filled those 75 issues i can honestly say that um the amount of joy that i've had from the books and still get from the comics and just the whole idea of a conan like world means i'm voting for conan every every day of the week and um, me being a cheating git knew that immediately. <laughs> but I can't believe because I love Sandman as well. Yeah, <laughs> Thrown under the bus. Let, hopefully, we're going to have a very full feedback corner next <laughs> next episode. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you two clowns playing at? Conan beat the Sandman. In what world is that right? <laughs> well, okay, that's a clear win for fantasy. And to be honest, um. Considering one of us has kickstarted a fantasy title, um, <laughs> I'm not overly surprised at that. Um, yeah. So I definitely played against your strengths there. So. Yeah. Well. Right. So fantasy wins over adult. I, I must admit, it is very interesting to explore some of these. I was, I wish I'd had more time this week uh, to do. Um, you know, a, 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 a better job overall, because um, particularly once I started down, it's kind of like you say, once you come through a realisation about some books or some titles or, in, you know, genres as a whole, you can have quite a, you know an interesting time exploring new, new books that you found that you've only found through, you know, or, or even find they fit into that genre. So it's... Um, the it's research really does, does it. bring a lot of stuff, doesn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm getting a lot of this. I'm hoping, like I said, that we're giving enough things out there if for people yeah. to actually look up. I mean, this um, is what it comes down to, yeah. It's it's not about the best genre, is it? It's just about, hopefully, if you've got more time than you used to and you want to read some good comics, we've given you a shed load of, you know, ideas, particularly if you like a particular genre, isn't it? And hopefully we've said either enough incorrect stuff or <laughs> vague controversial choices that we're going to get some more feedback. Um, I, I can hear Tom's typewriter going now. Um, <laughs> dear editor. Um, oh, we, <laughs> how much do we owe him after this? After oh, this God. Episode? That's I'm the problem. Remortgage the property. <laughs> oh. That's a cracker one. Am I allowed to say the remaining yeah, genres that will be in Group D? Yeah. Will be zombie, comedy, 
superhero and drama. There's some big hitters in there. Big, big hitters. Yes. Already. I mean, we we have um, we have picked. We know what we we've, we've got now as well, don't we? Because we've pre-picked the. Yeah, those are the last four genres, but we don't know which ones are playing which. We'll do that live. Cool. Right. Awesome, awesome. Mike. It's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank anybody who has, has made it to the end. I have had, or we've had, some requests about the medals that we keep talking about <laughs> that people deserve <laughs> for getting to the end. We've just, I've just looked now and we've hit two, 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 two. So that's... Um, Two hours, twenty-two minutes, and twenty-two seconds. So, I, I'm it's... thinking we need to introduce a, a code word at this point to see, get them to prove they lasted this long. Yeah, that's true. Isn't it? Oh, the I remember Adam and Joe used to have uh, the Black Squadron, and they called anybody who made it the. Uh, it was either the oh, see, I've forgotten. Now. It was either the beginning or the end. They used to call them Black Squadron. I'm pretty sure it was the end. So we need our own kind of uh, group for the people that have made it to the end of the, the mutter down. Well, go on. What, what are you drinking at the moment? I just thought of one. The name for the people who've made it to the end, if we take a little cue from the old Doctor Strange comics, and we call them the mindless ones. <laughs> <laughs> right, we've got our group name. We'll do so, real ales for the password. What are you on at the moment? Um, I think I'm on a Thomas Watkins Blodwin. Blodwin is the password. <laughs> right. <laughs> awesome. Nice one. Thank you, Mike. Thanks to anyone who's been listening. Uh, uh, if you want to harangue me, and tell me how wrong I've been. Uh, you can catch me on Twitter at this man this Pete. And Mike. And you can get me through Twitter at Cthulhu Punk. And uh, thank you once again for listening. And join us next time for Group D. And um, I'll see you soon. Cheers. Until next time. Thank you for listening. Find out more about the festival at comicartfestival.com. Find out more about the show and how to contact us at comicartpodcast.uk. Find us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Music composed by Pop Noir. This podcast is part of Brit Pod Scene, an independent network of uniquely British podcasts that's always growing. Check out BritPodScene.com or BritPodScene on Twitter to find out more. Oh.